Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting for Monday, March 13th, 2017. We are starting a little bit earlier tonight, 6 o'clock. I apologize. I wasn't paying attention to the clock. We're a little after 6. Uh, what I'm going to do, um, along with the Vice Chair and my colleagues' um, approval, is sort of jump around on the agenda. But the first thing I'd like to do is to call upon our town manager. Uh, we've all gotten emails, calls, queries regarding the current storm. If you could just give an update on that. It's going to happen, he said. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I would never make a, meteorolo a meteorological prediction from this, uh, from this seat. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we've already announced, or the superintendent has already announced that school will be canceled tomorrow. Uh, trash will be delayed one day, and there will be a townwide parking ban beginning at 9 a.m. In, anticipa uh, in anticipation of the storm tomorrow. We're, I'm going to hold off just a little while longer on a town office and library decision, but should make that decision probably before the time this meeting is over. Uh, the forecasts seem to be ranging from anywhere from 12 to 18 to maybe more inches of snow tomorrow, so it seems like it's going to be a very significant event. Uh, also high winds, heavy wet snow, so th there's the chance of power outages. So we're going to have both our own in-house tree crew and a private tree crew available. Uh, last point, um, I've heard some word that there's concern that since we are over our snow budget, that we may have less resources to put towards meeting the storm tomorrow. That's not the case. Uh, though we are over the appropriated amount for the snow budget, we have adequate reserves to be able to treat and fight this storm just like we would any other storm. So there's no, no concern in terms of resources. That's all. Thank you. And uh, next we'll go to uh, agenda item one, introduction, newly appointed redevelopment board member, someone who is uh, no stranger to any of us. Name and address just for the record. Eugene Benson, 16 Hillsdale Road. Good to see you. You can uh, move the mic and bend it up towards you a little bit, but you do want to get a little close to it and it'll work better. Okay. Thank if you. If you could just give just a brief, in terms of people that are watching this that may know your face or may not know your face, just in terms of um, why you've uh, applied for and soon will be elected a redevelopment board member. Well, first, I'd like to thank you for approving my appointment last time when I couldn't be here. I hope that I do well um, by the town in my time on the redevelopment board. I've lived in the town since 1990, know the town pretty well. I was on the Vision 2020 um, steering committee for a number of years. I was on the Council on Aging for a few years. I teach in a planning school. I actually teach um, planning and land use law, so I have a pretty good familiarity with uh, the work of the redevelopment board, and I have a real interest in, in making sure that it carries out uh, the master plan that the town had adopted and does it in a smart way. That's very brief. Thank you, and I'm not sure, I think Mr. Dunn maybe made the motion. I'm not sure, we, we've already yeah. sort of pre-approved um, uh, to bring you in, and once again, thank you for volunteering for this position you you served in so many other capacities um that uh we couldn't begin to thank you enough and having worked with you in the past um i know you'll be, truly be an asset um in terms of the different uh redevelopment and other issues that are coming up before various boards and commissions in the town and i, I really do thank you because i know this is a, once again a kind of intense time commitment, uh, volunteer time commitment, and, and definitely do appreciate that. And thank you for coming. In. Well, thank, thank you, everyone. Next, if I could go to agenda item eight, an appointment to the Equal Opportunity Advisory Committee, Lori Lennon, term to expire December 31st, 2020. If Lori's here, if you can just say your name and address for the record and a little preamble. Sure. Uh, my name is Lori Lennon. I live at 147 Palmer Street. <laughs> I moved to Arlington about two years ago with my daughter, Kira. Um, I work at Northeastern University. Uh, I'm a science communications person, and I also serve on the um, diversity committee at my, um, at my university. Is there a motion, Mr. Dunn? Uh, move approval. Second. Moved by Mr. Dunn, second yeah. by Mr. Byrne. Mr. Dunn? I, I loved your resume. I thought the, a lot of the communication stuff is going to be really helpful because I think a lot of the work of this committee is uh, sharing messages that the town needs to have here. So thank you very much. Great. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, any further questions on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne? And thank you, Kiara, for coming down. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimous vote. What do you think, Kiara? We did okay? 
Thumbs up? <laughs> She's like, Mom, I want to go home. Get me yeah. out of here. <laughs> my kids are the same. Thank you. Uh, now, with my colleagues also approval, we will move to the Warren article hearings. Articles for review first, uh, Article 11, the bylaw amendment, residential construction, open evacuation and demolition, activity regulations. Uh, we have actually four sort of in the same venue, vein, 11, 12, 13, 14. I don't know if Mr. Chapdelaine would like to. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if it suits the board, I think we'd like to speak to articles 11, 12, 13, and 14 collectively. I'll provide some brief introductory remarks. Town Council, I will walk through the details and the technical aspects of the proposals. Uh, and then several members of the residential study group are here to share their thoughts on the process uh, and the proposals that are before you tonight. Uh, so briefly, I, I think the board will recall that at last year's town meeting, there was a great deal of discussion on various zoning topics in regards to residential zoning. Uh, the outcome of those discussions was a resolution or a vote of town meeting for the town manager to create a study group to look at issues of residential zoning and the impacts of construction in residential neighborhoods. That led to the formation of this residential study group, which had a mix of citizens, uh, people from the real, uh, real estate industry, construction industry, um, and various interested parties as well as town staff. Uh, the group has met, uh, I actually don't have a count, but it has to be over a dozen times since the fall through the winter, uh, has done a great deal of work uh, both in the meeting setting, has toured uh, various uh, sites of construction at various points in the construction process, uh, excavation, construction, completion, talked to abutters about their feelings about the process of construction, uh, the group has also performed uh, or issued a survey to those who have lived near construction sites uh, and re redevelopment sites to get their take on the process. And one, one thing that I'll speak for myself in saying is what seems to have come out of the process is a feeling that there is legitimate concern about certain aspects of zoning and what is allowed to be built, but more predominantly, there's concern about the construction process and the impacts of that construction process. So you'll see that tonight, much of what is being proposed aims at better managing the construction process. The noise, the sounds, the dust, the, all, all the impacts that can come from a construction project. Uh, what's not before the board tonight, though very tightly ties to uh, the discussion at town meeting last year and will be before the ARB tonight, is a proposal to limit the slope of downward driveways. Uh, the board may remember there's a lot of discussion about that. Uh, again, that won't be before the board tonight. It is part of this suite of recommendations coming out of the residential study group, but that in and of itself is a zoning recommendation. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, if it's okay with the board, I'll have Doug walk through the actual proposals themselves. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry for running late this evening. Um, I just want to echo at the very beginning uh, the town manager's uh, sentiment that the residential study group worked extraordinarily hard and creatively to come up with the recommendations in front of you. Um, I was only there for certain pieces of it, the drafting of Warren articles and then the drafting of the actual motions, but I just want to again commend them on their work to have a very inclusive mindset and to um, really uh, work on a set of compromises that makes for a functional set of uh, uh, town bylaw amendments uh, to serve these interests. Uh, as the town manager said, uh, we have um, a series of town warrant articles that come together to form three separate votes. Two of them were condensed for reasons I'll get into for a minute. Uh, but the uh, first piece of this is about increasing um, the number of uh, events that would trigger meaningful notice to abutters when certain residential construction activities take place. In the bylaws presently, there's a demolition bylaw that notifies folks within 200 feet that a demolition is going to take place. But um, if a demolition wasn't part of a project, for example, the Irving Street project that generated a lot of controversy, uh, there was no reason for a notice to go out under the bylaws as they're presently constructed. This would expand the set of things that triggers that notice requirement and also uh, create further detail in terms of what that notice consists of. So first and foremost, uh, the notice would now be expanded to not only demolition, but um, open foundation excavations, large addition sites, um, and um, new construction, so that there's a broader set of things that are being captured. Second, uh, it prompts a more comprehensive dialogue and shared set of expectations by noting the things that have to be uh, 
given to abutters or the folks within this 200 feet of the site. So that includes things like what the anticipated uh, completion data for a project is, what the anticipated work hours for the project will be, a site plan, among other things, some of which will only be appropriate depending on the type of project that's taking place. And I'll obviously let the residential study group address why this is so important, but that's the first measure that we're here to discuss. And again, it would capture many things that residents have been complaining about in terms of things that they weren't aware of before the construction started. <clears throat> the second piece of uh, what the town manager described it as a suite of changes are um, essentially one motion on two warrant articles, articles 12 and 13, to establish a set of um, site condition responsibilities that are going to be codified in the bylaws. So one of the things I expect the residential study group uh, representatives to talk about a little bit more is that one of the things that will be worked on in conjunction with these uh, warrant articles at town meeting is an end construction control agreement that will enable developers and contractors to have one document that outlines all the expectations from the town, either from town bylaws, building regulations, health department regulations, or other sources that says this is what you're expected to do when you're conducting residential construction in Arlington, and these are essentially the rules. Um, this is adding a significant set of uh, additional rules in terms of uh, things that are meant to mitigate the quality of life impacts of residential construction. Things like making sure that um, um, uh, construction equipment that's not being used anymore is promptly removed from the site. Uh, making sure that uh, materials are stored in safe and secure locations so that you don't have construction materials you know, um, getting scattered in a windstorm or something like that. Making sure that portable restrooms are uh, arranged in a place that's at least 10 feet wherever feasible away from an abutter's property line. All things that aren't presently recorded in our bylaws now. Um, and obviously they're, they're sort of self-explanatory uh, to some degree. And then the final piece of it is uh, an adjustment of our present uh, noise abatement bylaw to modify the hours uh, to shrink the uh, time during the day when very specific construction activities are not allowed. So this doesn't mean that no construction activities are allowed, but it means that really the noisiest types of construction activities, uh, heavy equipment and certain other things that are already listed in our bylaws are not permitted during the hours of uh, nine to five on Saturday, Sundays, or legal holidays, and eight to six on all other days. So again, I'll, I'll let the residential study group talk a little bit more about the rationale for all the uh, devel developments that they're proposing to you. But this is the uh, suite of things that, 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 they're, that these three votes will encompass. And again, um, among the many things that they're meant to address, they are addressing some very specific situations that were raised at town meeting, like Irving Street, where the noise was such a substantial issue for folks, but there wasn't really a lot in the town bylaws, at least, that we could do about it. So this would improve upon that situation. Thank you. Mr. Ch Mr. Town Manager. The only other thing I <clears throat> wanted to add, and I'm sorry for not adding this at the beginning, is I think everybody in the group feels very good about this work. Um, we think it's going to address a number of the issues. But we also want to be clear that the work of this group is going to continue through the summer parallel with zoning recodification and potentially have further recommendations at a special town meeting in the fall when zoning recodification is being considered. So uh, the question very well could come up here tonight or a town meeting of, well, you, didn't, you did not achieve this thing that we wanted to achieve. Uh, and we're certainly not shutting the door after these recommendations. We continue to, we have plan to continue to keep meeting and addressing concerns. Um, before I move on, any, Mr. Byrne? Um, thank you very much, um, Ms. Chair. Um, I, I did have a, um, a, a couple questions, but I just want to start by, of course, thanking the recodification group. Um, this was an important work, uh, body of work, and I think we heard quite a bit of it last year at town meeting and even before that. So I, I, I know this is a step in the right direction, and I am very grateful for everyone who came to the table. I think over the past few years, um, you know, when, when tough issues come up, I, I think Arlington has a, a really good track record of bringing people with potentially opposing views uh, to the table to, to work out their differences. And I think this is a good example of it. Uh, we saw it with uh, leaf blowers, and, and we saw it, I think, uh, last year very much so with the tree bylaw. And, and that's something I'm, I'm really proud of, um, of the work throughout the community. Um, I did have, um, and I think Adam might have just covered this, but one question I think about the process. Um, 
do you feel that there was, you know, I don't know if support would be the right word, but a general acceptance uh, around the table that this is, you know, workable for all parties involved? I have that feeling. Uh, I'll certainly let some of the members speak for themselves here. Mm -hmm. But I think there was, there was some good, honest feedback. I mean, they, they weren't all harmonious meetings. They were courteous meetings. They were, they were very polite meetings. But there were, there were disagreements. There was back and forth. And I, I, I feel like what's being proposed was a compromise position that all felt, you know, maybe would require some adjustments, but were workable. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Um, I would just put a question or a case in point scenario forth to any future speakers that are going to speak on this, and I know we have the building inspector here, um, as well as uh, members of the committee and others that have uh, met on that. Uh, f following on Mr. Burns' remarks, I know that when we went through the leaf blower episode, which town meeting uh, granted me the opportunity to <clears throat> work with the different constituencies there, one of the um, main points encountered with that group that we kind of got a creative sol solution to resolve and also I got the same kind of calls on around the Irving Street issue and plus I have a personal um, experience with this so my question would be and it's not required but one of the things when we were going through the uh, leaf blower issue was uh, families that have uh, either children or young adults that are sensory stimulated can be overloaded um, in terms of when we were talking about the leaf blower uh, compromise and they did come up with a solution to that for a contact person so my question would be and I don't know if this can be captured or answered here tonight or even in the fall uh, but if you're a neighbor to a project that's having demolition and you have someone in your family with special needs, a child or a young adult or adult, um, it, everybody understands, you know, things have to get built and leaves have to be blown. But what one of the things that we encountered with leaf blowers and with Irving Street, I got two calls on, was um, the individual said, I have a personal circumstance with my family member. If there's any way that I could know, recognizing you can't guarantee 100%, but if there was a, whether it's a person I can contact, whether it's through the town, the person that I can speak to, that can give, or, or whether it's, you know, a point person for that particular project, you know, let's, let's say it was on Howard Street, I don't mean to, that um, if I have someone with special needs that, you know, that kind of loud, sound, consistent, um, banging really kind of sets them off you know is there a way and if there's not it's okay but is there a way that I can contact someone either through the town of Arlington or through the individual project site manager themselves recognizing you know it won't be a hundred percent sometimes other things come up but w what they said similar to when we went through the leaf blowing uh, incident and only it's only come up in three parts of town and, and uh, Gary Tibbetts has been the point person that they say you know, you can call me, we'll let you know when this activity is going to occur. And usually what you do is you uh, take that individual, if they are overstimulated by any kind of sensory sound banging, you can kind of make plans to, you know, transition them to something else. So I'm not saying there should be a solution to this, but I did want to, because I did get two calls on one of the most recent projects, and I can certainly sympathize. It might sound like I'm kind of embellishing it a little bit so I just would put that forth to any speaker who will be coming up if it's been discussed if it's already been addressed that there's a root venue that you can do that or if it's something that you know what we'll talk about that in the future and, and see if there's something we can do am I sort of I, I hear I think Doug had a response yeah I, I think that one of the things and I, I want the study group to be able to speak on whatever they, mm -hmm. they'd like but I think that this Type of the, the notice here sh and the information that will be provided should dramatically improve the situation for those types of um, folks in those types of circumstances right off the bat. Because again, part of it's creating a set of expectations. This is when you say that you're going to start this project and when you're going to finish it. This is when you're saying the operating hours are going to be. This is what you're saying is going to be required for noise abatement if it's going to be appropriate here. And hopefully, what that will do is even if that doesn't fit within the four corners of what's strictly required under the notification bylaw, it'll arm somebody with the information to contact the developer or builder and say, listen, this is my situation. 
I'd just like to be able to contact somebody and, let, and, and have some idea of what I can expect so that I can plan accordingly. Because I think that's part of what happens for a lot of folks with other young children or children with maybe some special needs, is that they just want some clear information so that they can plan accordingly and maybe ask, even if it's not strictly required, for some reasonable accommodations, which I get the sense from our residential study group. Um, a lot of folks feel like there's a lot of developers and builders out there who are gonna be sensitive to these types of things if there's a dialogue that can already be established. Okay, did you? Um, I was gonna, and then Mr. Carroll, uh, if I can call on the building inspector if there's anything and then, if, th if that's okay, Mr. Carroll. Yep. Good evening all, thanks for having us. Uh, your brother said the bachelor party is going well. You'll be all set. <laughs> Name and position for the record for those who don't know you. Michael Byrne, Director of Inspectional Services. Thank you. Um, everything that's been said has been said so far. It couldn't be more, more accurate. The boards, this committee has worked harder than anyone I've ever been on. It's, it's, I'm proud to say that I've been on this committee with these people. Um, the, 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 the situation you brought up is exactly what this, is the, 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 I see this agreement as, as, as being part of. Um, I, 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 you know, I just wanted the, 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 I would say we we're lucky to have a good base of builders in town. We do have a few that come into town, and the, we need these regulations to be able to, to, for Rick and I to go out and say, listen, now we've got this. You know, it's always been, well, where's, where's the regulation? A lot of these now, now we have them. We're armed with them. Um, and I, I don't see us actually having to get to a point of finding and whatnot with a lot of these regulations. Um, but I think that now that we have split, we have some teeth what to say. Um, I think a lot of these situations will be will, will go away. Um, again, the, the notification is key. Right now, there is none. Uh, the way things are, I think a lot of the situations may not be perfect, but I think just the, that that beginning conversation with anything that's going on um, it will, will, will be a huge help. That, that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Don't run away. <laughs> Through you, you have permission. Yeah. I, I should know better than get up first. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> you're, you're in trouble, Mike. Um, I actually had two questions on these. I, mean, I don't know if the building inspector is, is the most appropriate to answer, but actually on the, the um, abutter notification, I was curious how we're defining abutter here. Are we defining inhabitants of the property or owners of the property? Because obviously the impacts are mostly on the inhabitants of, right. of a property. Yeah, I, I believe it goes, the, it goes to the owners of the property. I think with their being, being, I may be wrong, but I think it's their, uh, their duty to inform their tenants, per se, I believe. Yeah. Um, I know like the big condo complexes, each one of the, the members, I believe each condo association person gets one, but I don't know about the, the actual renters. I, we wouldn't have a list of, of who's living at whatever address in town, um, except for the owner's list, so they, they go by the, uh, the assessor's list. I didn't know if we had considered a mechanism other than just first class mail. Yeah, I, but not first day. Because this is where, I mean, I know that we've, we've this has come up before with other, other times where we're and, renters. And can I piggyback on your question, Mr. Carroll? Yeah. I understand it's, it's the owners of the property. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're the inhabitant, the renter or right. lease or leasee, and um, if all of a sudden a project begins, they know nothing about it, they contact a member of the board, they call the selectman's office, and we say we've done proper notification, but they say we don't know anything about it. To whom or where would we direct them to get yep. the information to say, this is what your <coughs> this is what your owner got, yep. so this is what's going to happen? Would it be? Well, what well, may may help. Part, part of this is is, is, a, is a sign Sorry. to be put up on the property be, before the property before the project starts. Would have what's going on, the owner's you know the, the builder's name. I'm sure there'll be our contact on there. Um, so the, 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 someone would know across the street that, that something's going on. There'll be a big sign put up. At, Carol, um, but we're not adverse to if there's some way of reaching it out to tenants, I don't believe. So what I'm saying is if, if, if that happens, would it be inappropriate to tell them to it's, call the building they'll inspector? Be calling, they'll be calling the building department. Okay, yep. sorry. Yep. And, they should. and they should. Because <laughs> I don't it's, mean to. It's, it, we get it. It's, it, it's, it's a big disturbance to, to neighborhoods. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, the chair. <laughs> Madam Chair. Attorney oh, uh, Hines, sorry. I, I do want to um, <coughs> just say that there is, we, we are gonna work with some functional limitations in the sense that it might present a very difficult situation not only for builders and developers, but for the town and the inspectional services department to um, 
I mean, it, it seems like it would be easy, but I don't know how easy it is in the sense yeah. that, you know, when we're trying to keep track of, in some areas, it'd be fairly easy to know, you know, who are renters and who's not, but this is within a 200 foot, you know, uh, zone around the site. So it, it is gonna be somewhat tricky to um, have the information uh, updated enough that we would necessarily be able to capture all folks who might be in a renting situation, or especially if you've got uh, multiple uh, units in like a multifamily dwelling or something like that. So I, I, we, we may be dealing with some just logistical limitations in terms of what we can do, but I would say that I think a certain amount of responsibility has to be put on landlords to make sure that their tenants are apprised of these types of, of developments, and that's the information that we usually have on file, both in inspectional yeah. services and the assessors. I agree. I, I agree, ex except that the absentee landlord probably doesn't have a lot of context about mm -hmm. what this even means when they get it, that they should be notified. I mean, it seems that we have a true list and we have a property list, and it should be possible to merge that, and that's not going to get everybody either, but it, but it gets you a little bit closer. Um, and that, so that's just something that I, I, I question. So that was, that was my first question. So if we can kind of mull over whether there's a, a better solution to that than right. just, just the owners, because I'm, I'm not feeling completely mm -hmm. comfortable with just, just the owners. Because um, I understand it's their responsibility, but that doesn't actually help the resident until after the fact. Um, the, the second question I have, hopefully, is a lot easier, is <laughs> the, the drive entrance pads. It says that um, unless they're required unless it's deemed technically infeasible. What, what would be a, an example of what might render it technically infeasible? I, I say it's a dirt road and it's already told a dirt process, the whole part of it. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I think each case would be individual. I think if they're talking about trying to get the dust off vehicles, what are they pulling in and out of the, out of the properties onto streets? Um, so I would think um, one that wouldn't be if it's all dirt anyways or yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. That's all I have, questions. Uh, yeah, were, you, were you gonna invite other people? <clears throat> yes, okay. and now we'll go back to. <clears throat> Who's gonna take the first crack at this? Name, address, or uh, organization for the record, sir. We may have to lower this, sorry. <laughs> uh, Steve McKenna, part of the residential study group for Upland Road in Arlington, Mass. A um, few things I'd like to say. First, echo what uh, the town manager said is that, you know, last year town meeting was heavily debated from both sides, uh, and, and I became very vocal on it. And I think that the, the opposing sides have really spent a lot of time since September understanding what's going on. And it was an enlightening and eye-opening eye experience for every single person. I've been in the real estate business for 30 years, and I know the first rule is communication is the most important thing. Never ever thought about communicating from a developer or a builder to tell the neighbors what's going on. Simple. We realized that from our meetings, our site visits, going out to construction sites, looking at what was occurring, hearing directly from the neighbors, from the abutters, seeing some of the sites. As Mr. Burns said, we got some really good builders in town. There's some that aren't. There's some that have come in town just once and caused problems. What we came up with is after understanding that how the communication was critical, we spent time understanding that it deals with mutual respect, communication, and actually this construction agreement is really a good neighbor agreement. The developer needs to go in and understand that what's most paramount is safety, first of all. And you've got construction equipment coming in and out of a site, whether it's during school hours or summer vacation, but there are people living on the street. And if everybody on the site is aware of what's happening and what's occurring prior to the commencement, we realize that communication can make the biggest impact on saving difficult times for the neighbors, difficult times for the building inspector, and difficult times for the, the builder itself. The, the other thing that we, we realized is that we're making decisions and having an impact on every property owner's life and every na resident in Arlington. So we spent an intense amount of time putting together a survey that was sent out to over 600 people in addition to builders and developers. And we got their feedback. Instead of us making the decision for them, we actually got the feedback from who was actually impacting what was happening. 
And we've just started reviewing a lot of the data coming in, but it was impactful to see that the communication was the most important thing that people were concerned about. It wasn't necessarily what we had been hearing about the size or the look of the houses, but it was just telling me what's going on. So some of the things that we've looked at was understanding the process and looking at it. We have developers, we have real estate people, we have a lot of people that have been vocalized against a lot of the development town, and we spent time understanding and correlating the information. So the construction agreement is intense to put a lot of responsibility on the builder, the developer, to be not only courteous, but to really have an eye opening experience of what is important within the neighborhood. And as Mr. Bernard mentioned, if they don't adhere to these, there's fines that will be imposed. But one of the biggest things we looked at right away was that when a permit is sent in for an application and it's submitted to the building inspector, within seven days of that permit being just filled out for the application, so the permit's not given, the application is submitted, that builder then has to notify within 200 feet everybody of what they are planning on doing. And this involves a site plan, a time frame of when they think construction is going to start, how long it will take, the process, and we think that this is something that is going to ease the worry and concern of a lot of people. There's also additional items that we've put as far as restrictions, as far as keeping the site clean, keeping the neighborhood clean with the, you talked about the pad yeah. and so forth. We're looking into the noise situation and a lot of other things, but th the, the fact is that this construction agreement really encompasses a lot of the concerns that we've heard from everyone without the throughout the neighborhood and within the town. And we don't see that there is any reason that any reasonable developer would not accept this, understand this, and adhere to it. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Name, address, or affiliation for the record? Winnell Evans. I'm a town appointee to the um, residential study group. And I don't have a whole lot to add to this except just to emphasize again how important we felt that communication was particularly after we made our site visits in the fall. We went to Oakland Avenue, Kensington Park, um, Park Street, and I think that was all of them. There might have been one more, but neighbors saw us and descended on us. <laughs> um, and it really kind of drove home how eager they were to have somebody to talk to and somebody to hear their concerns. You know, one man on Oakland Ave had lost a tree because he wasn't, he didn't know when construction was gonna be beginning and hadn't been able to communicate with the builder and the roots were cut and the tree died. I have an acquaintance who came home after a one week vacation to find a pit beside her house you know, the house had been demolished, she doesn't know what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we came to really hear how important it was for people to know what was going on. And I agree that I think that this is going to assuage a lot of concerns. But I do also want to emphasize that this is going to be good for builders as well. As Mr. Burns said, um, and a couple of other people have mentioned, it puts everything into one document for them. So they're not having to do a sort of a piecemeal uh, research project into, into what they need to do. It will also limit for their benefit the period of time in which an abutter can bring an appeal against their permits. So it does have some significant benefits for the builders. Um, we um, have based this on agreements that are in place in some other communities, so we, we really looked into what's out there and what's working and what has been accepted. So I, I hope that, that everybody will get on board with this. Thank you. <coughs> good, you ducked. <laughs> <laughs> you learn eventually. Uh, good evening, uh, Joe Barr. Um, I'm a resident at 24 Park Street. Um, actually, I believe one of the houses that the residential study group looked at. Um, well, I don't know, favorably or not. Uh, and I'm uh, the co-chair of the Master Plan Implementation Committee. And the, um, all of this work, although it's a tremendous amount of work that they've done, more work than we've done on this issue, but it sort of has its genesis from the master plan and from the MPIC. And so I just wanted to speak briefly on behalf of the MP MPIC to say that, you know, we have reviewed the work that they did. Uh, we had met last week and voted uh, to endorse the, you know, both the um, bylaws and the zoning amendments that are before the ARB. Uh, and, so, and, and definitely feel like these are, you know, very, good progress in terms of resolving many of the issues that are that have been brought up. I think when 
when we had when there were zoning amendments proposed at last year's annual town meeting and they didn't move forward. We were all sort of a little bit disappointed, but I think in the end, the effort that came out of that and the residential study group and, and all the work that's happened since then really shows that you know there was a need for additional work and I think the members of that group, like I said a minute ago, really put in, it sounds like, you know, weekly meetings practically really took a tremendous amount of time to come, come up with some very thoughtful and very um, complete answers to a lot of the questions that have been raised, although there are still f further issues to be addressed. But I think the, the, the bylaws that you have before you and the zoning amendments that the ARB has in front of it, I think represent, like I said, a tremendous body of work that really tries to very substantively address the issues that have been raised by the community while protecting and, and trying to address the interests of a range of different stakeholders. So um, the MPIC is extremely supportive of that work uh, and, and very happy to see it moving forward uh, and look forward to you know, further progress in the master plan, but this was a huge issue uh, that was in there, and I think the fact that we've come up with some, you know, sort of consensus recommendations is a testament to all the hard work of the uh, study group members. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Mr. Dunn? I'm, I was just seeing no one else jumping up up there. Uh, I'm sold. I'm, I, I like the work. The committee sounds like it did great work, and I'm really glad that there's been a consensus and. Uh, the, the stuff that's been put forward makes perfect sense to me in, in that light, so uh, I'm happy to move approval. I do have one, one other comment to, to make. Um, and so uh, I noticed from, uh, and I'm curious in particular, uh, Mr. Heim and uh, Mr. Byrne, from, so from our uh, noise abatement bylaws, we define emergency work which is performed in an effort to alleviate, alleviate an emergency, and we have an exception which is um, like the, the, the you, which is it was here just a second ago, I swear. Uh, emergency work, so it's an exception, emergency work, the emission of sound in the performance of emergency work. Is that appropriate for the section we've got for the noise in this proposed bylaw, or is that unnecessary? Or I, I'm just a little, my own, I like it. I'm just a little bit, sometimes I feel like there's always a time where it is the right thing to do. <laughs> you know, your sewer line is, you know, broken open and you're trying to dig the new trench, something like that. Mike, do you want to talk about that or do you want me to address it? <clears throat> Evening again, Michael Byrne, Director of Inspectional Services. Um, I think, I, I, I don't have it in front of me either, but I, I believe the language is more for the, 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 the gas company, any, the water company, you know, the, the water department. The noise abatement, you mean? Yeah, yep. for, for those, mm -hmm. those, those are considered the emergency parts. Um, I wouldn't think putting a sewer line to a new house would be an emergency. Okay. So I don't know if they overlap, or I know we weren't trying to, to rewrite the entire zone, the, the yep. uh, town bylaw. And I don't know if that's, I think that might fall in that category. Okay. So you can make the case then that under construction, residential construction, there's never an emergency. I don't think And if there's something else, we would count it under. I, I think so. Okay. I think so. I'd have to see you it. You answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Mr. Chapdelaine? I just slide. Town Council and I just quickly discussed uh, Mr. Kuro's concern in regards to a butter notification. And I, I'll say I, I share concern that the Town Council expressed that it may be hard to guarantee that we will have a renter's name and address. I know the true list is a snapshot once a year. Uh, mm -hmm. So come mid-year it could be hard. But I think we could at least talk with the residential study group and we could talk ourselves about whether or not some kind of mandated or strongly recommended uh, flyer drop at properties within 200 feet could be could be performed um, to, to, to try to get at that issue. I'm not, I, I'm hesitant to ever recommending something that's a mandate that can't absolutely be accomplished. If somebody's moved and you don't have their address, but I think we can try to find a way, and if we can, we can try to incorporate it if the board so chooses into the final vote. I'd feel more comfortable with that. I mean, I'm happy to support the recommendations that are here, but I, I was gonna ask if, if we could put either an, either an uh, a definition of a butter in here or or some mechanism to get that because one once again you know once it goes through that chain of the landlords and the landlords don't pay attention to it yeah it ends up being our problem at the end of the day mm -hmm. too so maybe and, and i just want to make sure that i'm clear on my understanding on the back end that if the owner does not notify his or her tenant or tenants and i'm thinking of someone who's like severely autistic and if a caregiver or a parent knows that this loud 
blasting or pounding is going to happen and they didn't get notification and they contact the selectman's office or they contact the town manager's office to say can you just give me a schedule so i know you know some children or adults you can put headphones on them a newborn baby you can move to another room or sometimes it's you know because sometimes they start physically hurting themselves you'll take them to a different site so i i just want to make sure i'm sort of correct in my understanding that if you are within 200 feet and you didn't get notification and you contact someone from the town do we refer to this residential subcommittee or we refer to the building inspector so I just want to make sure before because that's what I will do I don't anticipate it will happen a lot but I did get two calls on a previous mr. Byrne well would that be an um, would that be a place where we as we do when we contact any um, department head go through the town manager would that oh, be from a board member absolutely mm. but if there's a resident with a concern we can say yeah okay thank you okay. that's fine with me um, so I'm, I'm gonna take for all four on a motion by mr. Dunn seconded by mr. Byrne but uh, I'm going to ask Attorney Heim, should I do each one individually? Uh, I think only if there's a sense that there's disagreement. Um, I, I, I think or that if the board wants to. Can I do all to, four together? I think that'd be fine. Okay, so for, uh, and nobody else here to speak on Warren Article 11, 12, 13, and 14, which are all the bylaw amendments for residential construction on a motion <clears throat> by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Any further questions? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimous vote on 11 through 14. Uh, we'll now go to Warren Article hearing for Article 17, bylaw amendment, regulation of plastic bags. Uh, I believe we have the proponent here. Yes. Could the proponent Excellent. just come um, up and anyone can speak on this, but just to start it off, if we can just get the name and address of the proponent who I know, but for everybody else. <laughs> It's a presentation. Do you, uh, you have a present. How long is your presentation about? Probably about 10, 10 minutes. You need all that time? Okay. We can try to do it faster. Oh, no, no. We you you know what? Just, Take 10 minutes. Go ahead. And if you prefer, we can. I don't know if you have. No, no. You, you've, you've taken the time to prepare it, so you, you get it all set to go. Yeah, I, Madam Chair. Uh, Perhaps town council could provide the background work he's done while we try to get the audio. Why don't we do that? So you can get the presentation set up to go, and if I could call an attorney, Heim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while I won't speak for uh, the sort of rationale and um, purpose behind the uh, <clears throat> bylaw amendment proposed by these folks, uh, I will note that um, they worked very uh, proactively with my office, um, as well as with some other town officials, to try to develop a. Um, feasible proposal to address the concerns that they're raising. Um, and what you have in front of you uh, from, from, from my office is a sort of base template. I wouldn't <coughs> say that this is polished in the sense that the, uh, I think the proponents have some changes that they would like to see in it. But you have a base that reflects a marriage of the approach that uh, some of our neighbors like Somerville have taken to regulation of uh, plastic bags and uh, some towns like Concord and other neighboring uh, communities uh, to, uh, you know, essentially um, create a fairly uh, cut and dry uh, proposal for <clears throat> limiting the uh, use of plastic bags basically at checkout points. And that's the most important sort of feature just to understand is that the uh, Regulation is really only about checkout points. It's not about um, internal points uh, within a grocery store, things like produce bags, meat, and things like that. It's really only supposed to be oriented around the end product and what you're taking to your car. Um, and within that, there's, uh, again, this is sort of closely related to what I would call the sort of Somerville model. Within that, there's uh, some ways in which uh, we can, um, I'm sorry, uh, retailers can make the transition easier for themselves uh, in terms of both making reusable plastic ba reusable uh, bags available as well as recycle recyclable paper bags. Um, there's also some uh, features here that would enable folks who are basically claiming that they have some sort of hardship for um, implementing this uh, bylaw um, in their stores to either get some extra time or some other type of consideration. 
Um, there's also two slightly different time frames. One for essentially large retail establishments like Stop and Shop, Walgreens, and another timeline for smaller uh, retail, retail shops. So with that, I'll uh, yield to the uh, proponents of the article. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Ballin. I am one of the four proponents. Um, the others are up here. Um, they will be sharing the pre presentation um, this evening, and uh, we will try to keep this brief. No, um, if you need 15 minutes, go right ahead. Right. Thank you. I Thank just you. wanted to get a sense. Thank you, John. Um, so I first just wanted to just uh, start out by saying, you know, why, how we came together. We are um, a group of four Arlington residents who share a concern for improving life in Arlington and uh, for promoting environmental protection. And um, three of the four of us are town meeting members, and we uh, got together to work on this and um, put together the warrant article. Um, so br very briefly, we have about. <laughs> Sorry about the That's okay. uh, logistical no. issues. Um, so very briefly, we do. This is just a, a brief overview to give you some idea as to um, why we are proposing this um, and um, uh, the uh, outreach efforts we've made um, in terms of. Um, residents and uh, retailers' concerns in towns and, and trying to answer some um, of what we think are maybe some of the uh, most common questions. Um, <laughs> just go back one. Is that okay? All right. Um, so very briefly, um, what would the proposed bylaw do? I think uh, town council did summarize this um, already while we were getting set up here. So I don't need to spend a lot more detail on it. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. We were initially looking at the Somerville model, which is to ban um, plastic bags provided um, at checkout in, in retail stores and restaurants in Arlington. Um, there would be an exemption for any kind of paper bags as well as um, many different kinds of plastic bags, which are shown here, um, essentially, uh, that includes things like newspaper bags, produce bags, dry cleaning bags, any kind of prepackaged foods or meat, um, meat uh, plastics uh, that wrap meat. Um, the detail, so the Somerville model we thought was uh, among the many that we looked at, we thought was, was um, a pretty straightforward and um, it did basically what we were looking for. I think when we looked further into this issue um, and uh, with a great deal of assistance from the assistant town manager, um, who I think wrote up a, a summary um, mm -hmm. on his uh, research. He did a lot of work in terms of contacting other towns um, that have implemented bans. And um, we benefited from his research. And one of the issues was sort of to, to tweak the, what we'd recommend the definitions be for um, reusable bags. So um, modeled more closely on what Brookline did. Brookline had a ban, um, has had a ban for a number of years, and they um, found a couple of sort of loopholes, I guess, that allowed um, uh, different kinds of plastic bags uh, to be used that they didn't intend. So we've tried to adopt um, or propose some re revisions to the draft bylaw um, to address what we think were some of those issues that, um, that Brookline um, discovered, and, and we would like to take uh, advantage of uh, what, what they learned in their process. Um, I'm going to go on to... Uh, Again, just very quickly, it's, it's fairly, fairly obvious that plastic bags are extraordinarily common. Um, 100, over 100 billion plastic bags um, in the US, it's estimated. That's about 2 billion in Massachusetts. Um, that's at least a bag per person per day. Um, the grocery stores typically provide um, around 20,000 plastic bags per week. Um, so it's obviously a, a very significant number. Um, So let me, uh, let me move on here. Um, the next uh, question that uh, we have heard many people ask is how common um, are these plastic bag bans throughout the, uh, Massachusetts? And I think uh, from the many discussions we've had with people, um, they were surprised to learn that there are already 42 uh, cities and towns in Massachusetts that have um, similar types of plastic bag um, bans. Um, that covers affects about over 100 million. Uh, I'm sorry, about a million people in Massachusetts. Um, there are more local plastic bag bans in Massachusetts than any other state besides California. 
Um, I wanted to mention on this slide, so, uh, and actually uh, there is a, um, <coughs> excuse me, in your uh, packet, there was a list of the 42 cities and towns that do have plastic bag bans um, and the 10 that are proposed, including Arlington, um, to be voted on this spring. Um, the ones that are closest to home, um, Somerville, Cambridge, Watertown, Brookline, Newton, Concord, Framingham, um, there are certainly ones scattered throughout uh, the entire state and um, including uh, as close as Bedford in terms of um, other communities that are, are um, looking at bans this coming spring. Um, there have been statewide bans in California and Hawaii and of course many major cities um, starting out um, primarily out in California with San Francisco and LA and um, spreading to other major cities as well have all seen um, plastic bag bans. Um, <clears throat> I should also just mention, at, you know, just at, uh, at the end here is um, there, there have been probably a handful to a dozen communities every year in the last couple of years that have been debating these bans and they seem to be expanding quite exponentially. Um, last year, the state Senate passed a plastic bag ban that did not get through the House, so um, that did not become state law, but we do think that that is where the direction um, of these statewide bans are going, and at some point we're, we're sort of getting close to a tipping point where I think um, industry in particular would prefer to have uh, one statewide standard than 351 city and town standards. So uh, we think there's a lot of momentum, um, and that this is really the right time for Arlington. But I want to uh, turn this over, I guess, to um, Laura, who'll come up here, and talk a little bit about the important question of why we are um, recommending this bill. And just your name for the record. I'm Laura Kiesel. Um, so I'm a citizen in Arlington. My professional academic background is in environmental science and wildlife biology. And I used to work for the town of Wellesley's Natural Resources Commission. And I was tasked with looking into when we first started considering a ban there. Actually, they just passed their ban a couple of months ago. But I was the one who got the ball rolling and started researching the impacts of plastic bags. So plastic bags have a huge impact on marine life. They kill over 100,000 marine creatures a year, including marine mammals, sharks, sea turtles, and one million seabirds annually. The plastic bags resemble jellyfish in the ocean, and that's why, which is a major staple of the diets of a lot of marine creatures. And even when plastic bags are attempted to be recycled, they, they form these microbeads, and when those get into the ocean, they look like fish eggs. So basically, a lot of creatures are eating these things. It's getting caught in their system and killing them. So a lot of people will ask the question of what is, you know, how about paper versus plastic? And while it's true that paper bags might have a larger greenhouse gas input in production, um, in terms of the end cycle use, you can, they biodegrade, they can be recycled and are recycled much more than plastic bags. Less than 10% of plastic bags are recycled in the United States. I think the Sierra Club puts it at about 5% a recycling rate. And even when you do recycle them, like I said, they're downcycled into those microbeads and they eventually still find their way into usually the marine ecosystem and wind up harming the, the sea life, and they eventually, the chemicals in those plastics get into our body when we ingest seafood. So that's one thing, as I mentioned, it is a greenhouse gas emission. I think it's 12 million barrels of oil per every 30 billion plastic bags. And now it's more fracked gas is being put into that. And it's just, they, it causes a huge um, clogging, clogging storm drains, clogging rivers. I know San Jose, when they did their ban, they did um, a study a few a year or two later, and they found a 89% um, reduction in storm drain clogging and a 60% reduction in the creeks and rivers. I spoke to a person at the Mystic River Watershed Association who anecdotally noted that it's one of the most common findings when they do watershed cleanups. So it's important to know that it's in our waterways. I've seen him in Spy Pond. I've done cleanups there as well. And it eventually will find its way into the Charles River and then into the oceans. And that's basically the major point. I've gone to, to other retailers to explain this because I know there's a lot of confusion of the paper versus plastic, but there's just not a good way to recycle them. And there are with paper bags. Thank you. 
And also, I think we do have a couple of pictures of them. Is it right click? There? Yeah, these yep, are some, some areas around. <clears throat> Just name for the record, stranger. Greg Dennis. Um, so what will this mean for consumers? Uh, first of all, as Jim said, at checkout, they'll have, still have bags. They'll have paper bags and reusable bags. And we've also included a number of reasonable exemptions for plastic bags, including protos bags, newspaper bags, laundry bags. Uh, so there's still going to be plenty of bags for your pet waste and those sorts of things. Um, and we also don't anticipate um, any increase in consumer costs. Now, why is that? Well, we do know that the cost per bag for a paper bag is more than plastic, but there are some mitigating factors here. Um, the first thing to realize is that plastic bags today aren't free. You might think of them that way. But they cost retailers about two to five cents per bag. Supermarkets spend somewhere between $1,500 and $6,000 a month on plastic bags, and that gets passed on to the consumer. Um, but the major point here is that bans on plastic bags tend to reduce total reusable, total disposable bag use because people by and, by and large switch to reusable bags as opposed to paper. Um, and that's been seen and backed up by a couple of studies of, of a couple of cities in California that have enacted bans. Um, retailers also see increased revenue from reusable bag sales. And I think it's also important to note that a number of retailers in Arlington primarily rely on paper bags already, Shattuck, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. Um, an interesting anecdote from Not Your Average Joe's is that they switch to paper bags because the bags are actually, they have to spend more per bag, but because the bags are sturdier, they have to use fewer of them to hold multiple takeout meals. And we've also learned uh, from looking around at other communities some best practices um, that we've learned from retailers. Uh, first is um, a number of places have had a longer phase-in. Um, we've talked about this, a longer phase-in for smaller retailers, uh, and we've included that um, in the draft bylaw you see, um, as well as a waiver process if there's a hardship for a particular retailer. Uh, retailers are also encouraged to offer discounts and other kinds of incentives for bringing your own bag. Um, Whole Foods and Trader Joe's have, um, one has a discount, one has some sort of raffle type incentive for bringing your own bag. And um, retailers are also encouraged to put their logo on these reusable bags and benefit from that kind of free advertising. Could I ask just a question on that? Um, yeah. Because I've seen this in, you know, Cambridge and Newton and some of the um, and it's really just one particular larger retailer that I won't say who that is, but what I've heard, the only downside that I've heard from um, residents and communities in cities and towns that have already passed it is sometimes one of their largest retailers, like if you go to Staples in Cambridge, if you go to C CVS in, uh, I think, Waltham or Watertown, and they have um, the paper bags as we already have in Trader Joe's and Shaddix and not your average Joe's, they have a handle on it. But in term, is there anything in terms of um, when we promote this message to retailers, especially a large retailer, and you can probably think of what, a, there's one large food retailer <laughs> that's in Arlington, is also in Somerville. Yes. Um, and what I've heard from people who um, walk and sometimes they have their carriages with them, you know, and they, they don't have a vehicle that when they switch the paper bag, that one large food retailer just gives them a bag with no handle. I, I'm, I'm accepting that we can't tell the businesses you have to provide a paper bag with a handle, which is what 90% of everybody else is doing. But is there some conveyance of that message, especially here in Arlington, to um, that particular retailer to ask them to consider that? Or is that something we can't even ask them? Do you know the question I'm yeah, asking? Yeah, can we ask them to put a handle on their paper bags? Can we Actually, suggest? Yeah, to suggest that I, um, I'm happy to suggest it. I think, yeah, I think we could suggest it, certainly. Yeah. That's the only downside. Yeah. I mean, not for anything, it's stop and shop. 
And yeah. when I've you know, spoken right. to people that live right by Stop and Shop in the projects or elderly residents who you know, walk to it and some of them have carriages so they can put it in there, but a lot of them carry, that's their big thing. And I know everybody else here in Arlington that is already using paper bags has that. So I know we can't require that. So if it's appropriate and if it's not appropriate for this committee to do, if um, somehow that message could be relayed, um, yeah, that if they have ever that. consider changing their format of their paper bag, if there could be a handle. And I, I think you also hit on an important point, which is a number of the larger retailers are already operating under a plastic bag ban in some other community, mm -hmm. including Stop and Shop and CVS and Walgreens. Okay, thank you. I don't want to take up too much of your time. No, no, uh, take your time, just your name for the record. Uh, Jim DiTullio, 31 Fountain Road, uh, town meeting member in Precinct 12. Um, so I think in these last few slides, many of the points have sort of already been made, but this particular slide I think is an important one. Um, we are working with the town manager's office. What we're proposing is a, is a very sort of phased in implementation schedule. Frankly, one that from what we've looked at other communities that have instituted plastic bag bans is um, probably one of the most generous ones towards retailers of any we've seen. Just as a comparison point, uh, Bedford, which uh, has their vote coming up at town meeting at the end of the month, of the end of this month, um, has no differentiation between large and small retailers. They just have one date and it's October 1st if it goes through. That's a very quick turnaround, but that's actually fairly typical. What we're proposing is a bifurcated um, implementation date for large retailers defined as 10,000 feet or greater, so sort of the big stores in town, uh, March 1st, which would still give them, I think, assuming it passed a town meeting about, nine, about 10 months, um, and for smaller retailers, anything under 10,000 feet, we're saying July 1st uh, of next year. So that's really about 14, 15 months. That's more than enough time for, and from talking to retailers, it's more than enough time for them to get through their current supply of plastic bags. Um, and frankly, I mean, the way we would see it is we could envision, and based on conversations we've had with retailers, many of them actually getting ahead of the actual date because once they run out of their plastic bags, it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to keep buying a new supply. So we, we, we envision very few retailers actually waiting until the final deadline um, if this were to go through. Um, enforcement would by, be by the Board of Health. Um, also, a fairly you know, reasonable um, violation schedule, a, a warning on the first violation, not an immediate fine, which is uncommon. Uh, in many communities, you're immediately slapped with a $50 or $100 fine for the first offense, um, and then allowing sort of a correction period. Um, and experience in other communities shows these bag bans actually require very little enforcement. And even at the initial deadline, first deadline for enforcement, um, you're seeing something like high 90% um, uh, compliance rates. So we would expect the same thing in Arlington. Um, Laura sort of already hit on this point. I mean, the goal is not really to move people from plastic to paper, um, although that is still, for the reasons here, a good move in terms of the recycling life of uh, the downstream <laughs> life of paper versus plastic. The real point here is to move people to reusables. And studies show from many California communities that were some of the first adopters of plastic bag bans, you actually see very significant shifts. Even when you don't ban paper, when you just ban plastic, you see significant shifts sometimes as high as 40 or 50 percent of uh, increase in sales of reusables. So it really does sort of have that paradigm shift of people just start thinking more. It's not just a bag that you don't even think about and get your, you know, your items in. You actually start to you know, think about this at checkout, and you see that real sh important shift to reusables, which is what we really want to see. Um, you know, there's these last, two of these last slides are sort of just sometimes common pushback questions that communities get about this. You know, why not just promote increased recycling of plastic bags? As Laura said, uh, the recycling rates are abysmally low. I mean, 10% is actually the high rate. The Sierra Club puts it at like 5.2, I think, or 5.3%. Um, and no matter how much uh, retailers try to sort of put the put the bag recycling bins out front. It just they don't ever re the, the recycling rate never gets really above five to ten percent, um, and we expect that it would remain low. The other the other thing that comes back to us actually on both ends of this debate is uh, some people say why can't you be like Cambridge and, and also put a, a fee on paper? 
at the other end of the debate, some would say, well, why are you banning plastic bags at all? You, why can't you just put a, a, a fee on the plastic and let people decide whether they want to pay for it? Excuse These are great questions. What we discovered in our research, we didn't know the answers when we began this exercise, but what we discovered in our research is actually the Attorney General's office, for a very complicated legal reason, which we don't have, we probably need an hour to, to, to analyze the legal opinion, but uh, you actually are not allowed under Massachusetts law, to, if you're a town, it's a different standard if you're a city, hence why Cambridge is able to do it, but you're not allowed to impose a fee on paper or plastic. You can, however, do a full-fledged ban. Um, as I said, it's a complicated reason, but we have to follow the Attorney General's office here. Um, why would this be good for Arlington, Laura, and uh, others mentioned this, you know, reducing litter, uh, that those photos of the bags around town, that was taken in a single 15 minute drive down Mass Ave, including the bag right outside here in the tree in Town Hall. So one didn't have to look very hard to, to get about five or six examples in a 15 minute period. Um, reduces storm drain cleanup costs, better for curbside recycling, uh, reduces the carbon footprint, beautifies the town, and, and puts us really a, a key part of the environmental leadership on this. I mean, a statewide ban, uh, all bets are that it's coming in five, at most 10 years. Um, our retailers who really get ahead of this, and the whole, and consumers in town get ahead of this, and chances are the statewide ban, which passed the Senate, Senator Donnelly voted for it when it passed the Senate uh, a year ago, uh, ultimately is probably pretty close to where the ban is going anyway. And who supports this? I mean, we've done a, a fair amount of, um, I would say actually a fairly extensive amount of outreach. Um, Arlington Recycling Committee unanimously endorsed it. The Arlington Board of Health just last week unanimously endorsed it. A statewide group, the Sierra Club, but also local groups like the Mr. River Watershed Association, the Friends of Spy Pond Park, as well as some business owners like Arlington Centered. Um, Arlington Centered uh, came to our attention because they have a location in Somerville and they said we were able to adapt there and it really wasn't any problem and we wouldn't see a reason why we couldn't do it here. We've also done extensive outreach to businesses. I think we've talked to maybe two dozen businesses among, among the four of us. Um, and we've gotten a range of opinions, but really no one stating outright opposition. It's sort of been everything from, hey, yeah, you know, that's a great idea and we would adapt to some shrugs, sort of like, okay, fine, that's sort of the way these things are going. And really no one vociferously opposing. And in fact, many businesses were quite open-minded and open to the idea. So, um, we really have tried to have those conversations, which many of you who we talked to had suggested we have, and um, it's generally been a good conversation. And I think just to, going to sound like a silly question, but it's just purely housekeeping and ticking off um, all the boxes. Um, any sort of uh, plastic containers, receptacles, et cetera, for medical uses are not governed by any of this. Not affected. Mm -hmm. Not affected. And I don't mean to put that question forward, but I just actually got one person who um, gave a case in point, and I said, well, number one, that's not really a retailer per se, f the example that they gave. And I said, of course, I assume that, you know, anything in terms of delivering medical services, um, whether you have to bring a plastic bag home, et cetera, would not, not affected be affected by this. No. Sorry, I know it's a silly no, no, question. No, 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 it's a good question. I promised I would question. ask, so. And we've gotten a lot of questions like that, you know, people just seeking clarification. Um, and usually once they get the clarification, they say, oh, yeah, sure, that still sounds good to us. So um, we're trying to keep this narrowly tailored um, and very focused and not just one of these broad-based um, bands that sort of overreaches. That, that was the concern, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Byrne? Um, so first, thank you all very much for your presentation. Uh, you can clearly see that there was you know, a lot of legwork that went into this proposal. Um, I'm really happy to um, see the you know, phased in implementation plan. I, I think that's very reasonable. I, I was thrilled to hear about the outreach to the businesses, um, you know, particularly the smaller businesses. And, and um, you know, I'm, I was happy to hear that they were fairly supportive of it. Um, you know, I think it is a, a step in the right direction. Um, one thing that, so I'll, I'll move approval uh, to begin with. Second. Um, Moved by Mr. Byrne, seconded by Mr. Carroll. Mr. Byrne. And, and one thing that I do um, think that we have to keep on our radar, and, and of course I'd be happy to, to, you know, work with the proponents, is how, you know, uh, the appropriate outreach. Um, you know, I'm thinking to the elderly uh, population in, in particular. 
in making sure that you know everyone's very aware of this. Um, I don't, you know, th this is you know even though it is phased in, it will be a fairly big change in how how you know people you know go about their day to day lives. And I, I do think that it's important that we um, develop a, a plan here to uh, you know make sure it's implemented properly. Mr. Carroll. Uh, thank you very much. I know we probably have other people to, to hear from, but um, I just want to say thank you for this. I, I have to say, I think since I've been sitting here, as far as a citizen warrant article, um, this is one of the best prepared presentations, I think, that, I, that I've seen um, come through here. Um, I think this makes sense. This isn't some crazy radical proposal. I mean, there are only so many things that we can do um, <clears throat> environmentally, but this also is in the town's interest. I mean, uh, we saw... Um, the recycling committee's letter uh, to us. And I visited that recycling facility uh, out in uh, Peabody, I think it was, uh, Pe oh, Saugus. it was right on the line, um, right before it opened. It's a huge facility, but, and it takes in the recycling for, uh, I don't know how many communities, but whenever they get one of these plastic bags that jams up the works, they have to stop the entire mm -hmm. line and manually clear it. And <laughs> down the line, that fiscally, that's gonna come back to us in the next, contract if we if we don't take some steps I think to, to try to get some of this out of the waste stream it won't get it all out we've got so many water bodies here in the town I think that that uh, that makes sense and waterfowl you see the swans are out well, they were maybe before the cold hit <laughs> they were out on the <laughs> mystic lakes last week um, and uh, you know I think uh, the, the assertion that this leads to actually um, uh, reusable bag use was was borne out also by the the letter we received from the Arlington business who operates in Somerville as well. They said that that's actually the effect that they had seen it having. Um, I, I spent some time uh, studying Germany probably 30 years ago, and when you we were one, you go to the grocery store, they didn't even have the paper option. You had to bring with you, and, and people ad adapted. And I, I think we still have. A paper option here, and and I, I think that this is actually not a real onerous um, uh, regulation. And I, I also want to say I want to appreciate the staff's time on this too. Mm -hmm. Mr. Feeney wrote an excellent memo on this too, and did a lot of excellent research. So, thank you. Mr. Um, I'm I'm happy to support it. Um, the, I would definitely think that I, I think that Mr. Burns' point is very well taken. And I think that we should ask this group, but also the uh, but also the Arlington uh, Sustainable Arlington, and really and say, you know, this is what like uh, I mean. Obviously, Sustainable Arlington has done a lot of work with the town about educating how recycling works and stuff like that. And this is an opportunity for them to say, you know, to, to break some new ground and new topics for them to cover. And I know they've passed out recycling bags at Town Day for free and things like that. Yep. And we should talk about like what other distribution points we could do for them and where we can find some funding source to make more of those. But just to make it a, you know, make it the more the more we cushion this transition, I think the less uh, distressing it could be. I'm usually stuffing my groceries in Uncle Sam bags and Robin's I was library say, bags. <laughs> <laughs> Town Day is a good good thing to hit to get your bags. Town Day is a, yeah. but we should do more. But, we should hit a few thinking, more venues. Yeah, you know? and and anything through the uh, Council on Aging Senior Association, um, yeah. a getting the the notice out as well as b um, perhaps once or twice a year, sort of having a campaign to mm. when they are delivering whether meals on wheels or something else, whatever they think of. I'm not saying they have to do that, but that might be a good, just this first initial year, um, sort of as an entree. So whatever they can brainstorm on. I, I would add uh, the Bar Housing Authority to that as well. Yeah, that was, oh, yeah. good point, good point. Um, is there anyone here who would like to speak to Article 17 that hasn't or wants to add to? If not, uh, uh, Mr. Attorney Heim, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, uh, uh, the recommended um, changes that the uh, proponents have put forth um, uh, look very sound and reasonable to me. With, uh, If the board's so inclined, I'd be uh, happy to draft a motion uh, based on um, the proposal that they, they took my proposal and basically updated it in the back of their materials. Is that okay with the board? That's all right, Mr. Byrne. That sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, and a motion by Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Any further questions or comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. 
I'm going to, because it's a time certain public hearing, as well as uh, Ms. Duffy from Eversource, I know is going back to get ready for the storm that's coming up, and hopefully you don't hear from any of us or the town manager tomorrow, but what I'd like to do is go to a public hearing, agenda item seven, from Eversource and Verizon petition on, on Gould Road, just name and organization for the record. Jackie Duffy, Eversource Energy, we need to take out a tree guy and put in an anchor guy because the tree is dying. It's a big um, Are there tree. any abutters or residents here for the Eversource Verizon petition on Gould Road? Uh, motion by one of my colleagues. So move, move uh, approval. Mr. Curo. Subject to all conditions set forth. Seconded by. <laughs> Second. Mr. Dunn, uh, any further questions or comments? Um, thank you for being here tonight. I thank know you any you're lights getting, issues, just you're Diane ramping has up. my number, just yeah. text me. We'll make sure. <laughs> <laughs> and a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. unanimous aye. vote. Thank Be you. safe. Thank you, Jackie. And now, uh, with my colleague's permission, we'll go back to the Warren article hearings. Article 26, is that where I am, Mr. Dunn? We just I, finished uh, plastic bags, so we're on. I believe on. I just closed that window 26. by mistake. Okay. Yes. Article 26, acceptance of legislation establishment of a parking benefits district. I should turn this over to Mr. Chapelain. I'd be happy to, to introduce it. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, members of the board, this would be perhaps one of the last big pieces of fully implementing the parking management plan in Arlington Center. Uh, you may recall that we've long talked about wanting to reinvest uh, portions of the parking revenue from the, par uh, the new parking meters on the street back into the business district. Um, we had talked about certain creative ways to be able to do that uh, in the absence of there being a statutory ability to clearly create a parking benefits district. However, the Municipal Modernization Act allows for the actual creation of a parking benefits district. So with the approval or acceptance of this legislation, uh, from an accounting perspective, um, I know the, the comptroller is here, and he and I, along with the deputy town manager, have been, uh, been working on this. This would really be set up as a, a sister fund or a sub fund of the parking fund that we created at the fall town meeting, except the proceeds contained in this fund would be directly invested back in the business district. Uh, it could be th things as simple as more regular street cleaning, snow plowing, beautification, uh, or it could be more significant long-lasting things such as street improvements uh, or just general infrastructure improvements. Uh, the plan I would be putting forth, and I'll be bringing this to the uh, Finance Committee on Wednesday, would be that any operating improvements be brought before the Finance Committee as any operating budget would be, and then uh, brought before town meeting similar to how we bring the CDBG, uh, CDBG budget before town meeting for endorsement, and then any capital improvements that would be spent out of this fund would follow the same process through the Capital Planning Committee, Finance Committee, and then the town meeting as well, so that we would have governance over the expenditure of funds. And when you say uh, <laughs> business districts as defined by zoning or as defined by sort of common practice of Warren, Broadway, Mass Ave, Summer? This, this is actually wherever the meters are defines okay. the parking, the I geographic limits of the parking benefit district. Uh -huh. So here it would be Arlington Center. Okay. Uh, ba basically the, the limits around where we, have, uh, where we have the street metering. Mr. Byrne? Yeah, so... Um, I am very excited about this uh, warrant article. I, I don't want to speak for the Implementation <coughs> and Governance Committee, but I think that they are as, as well. Um, so this is, um, you know, these are allowed in, in other states, and of course now that they're allowed here, I think we'll see more of them. Uh, I'd bring your attention to a parking benefits district that formed in Old Pasadena, California. All right. uh, and, um, you know, it, it was a, um, I don't want to say very similar Arlington Center, but I think they had uh, quite a few vacant properties. I, I think that it was, um, you know, could have used some improvements. And after a parking benefits district was formed, the property tax revenue tripled and the sales revenue quadrupled. Um, and I don't know the exact amount of time after that, but th those are pretty serious improvements. And I, I think, you know, when, when we look at some of our um, vacant storefronts and, and strategies that we have to um, combat that, and I think we're, we've been at the forefront of, of that issue. I think that this is, is another tool in, in the tool belt that will you know, help us see some change there. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to speak to projects, but I'm very happy that there's a potential for you know, very minor changes, such as improved lighting, 
or even bigger changes as a you know improved configuration um, of, of the whole center. So I think that there there's quite a few options, and as you know, the uh, parking implementation governance committee is meeting regularly, and I think that that group will continue to be involved in these discussions as you know if, if this is implemented and um, you know we're allowed to continue this work. So thank you. Is that a motion to approve? It certainly is. By Mr. Burns, seconded by Second. Mr. Carroll, Mr. Dunn. Uh, a couple questions. So, Adam, I think you, you explained this, but I just wanted to clarify. So for things like capital, is it literally under the jurisdiction of town meeting, or is it approval, like is it assent of town meeting? Like who literally is going to have the purse strings in this? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, the comptroller has reached out to the Department of Revenue, and because of the newness of this law, are not in <coughs> writing opining on whether or not these funds actually have to be appropriated or not. So we are currently pursuing this course where we bring it before town meeting for endorsement mm -hmm. uh, without further word from DOR. I'm sure we will get further word from DOR probably after town meeting. Um, if in the future they wish it to be appropriated, we'll do that. If they continue to say you don't have to appropriate it, I would certainly stay committed to bringing it before, ta before town meeting for endorsement anyways. Okay. Uh, how much money are we talking a year? I think in this first year we're probably talking about fifty to $70,000 um, with that uh, in year one with a chance to grow on a go forward basis. Thank you. Mr. Carroll. Also very enthusiastic. I think I went a number of years ago to a, uh, a day long seminar on parking that the MAPC put on, put on. I think they cited old Pasadena in that too and it's the first time I had heard of the concept. And I know that merchants I've talked to in the center you know, about this and I know you do on the, the, the committee enthusiastic about it. I've also found it's very helpful like, most, for the most part, I haven't heard a lot of negative feedback on, on the parking meters. You get, you get a little, and I think when uh, it's been explained to folks that we're potentially going to have this mechanism to, um, to use <coughs> the revenue to improve the center, the, the whole tone of the conversation has changed. And um, I, I think it's a great tool. I'm glad we're going to move forward. I, yeah, I'd actually add to that. I think, um, you know, in many other communities, um, have kind of led with a parking benefits district and where as when you start talking about meters a selling point is that this is what's going to happen with it yeah. and, and I think that that it's a you know, testament to, to the work that's done here in town and that we haven't really had that negative feedback and haven't really needed to you know utilize that but it is a, a very good selling point. <coughs> Excellent. Um, anyone else who would like to speak on Warren article 26? If not, on a motion by Mr. Burton, seconded by Mr. Kiro. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. We now go to Warren Article Hearing, Article 29, endorsement of CDBG application. Uh, so, if Mr. Chaplain? I will, uh, d depending on what uh, Mr. Dunn and Mr. Byrne would like to do, uh, Julie Wayman, the CDB administrator, is here to speak, if you'd like, or if you would like to, to kick it off with whichever you're comfortable with. Right. Yeah. yeah. Julie. Just name and position for the record. Julie Wayman, Community Development Block Grant Administrator. Um, I'm just going to be brief. Um, we are here to submit the funding recommendations from the CDBG subcommittee for fiscal year 18. Um, I think you have the report there in front of you and am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, Mr. Dunn? Uh, so, a few, so a few thoughts on the what, what went in. So as you know, uh, so one of the things that the report talks about is the the things that you can use CDBG money for, which is just, I, I think it was worth uh, reminding people of, low moderate income areas. So that means census zones within the town that have low to moderate income. Uh, low to moderate income clientele, so that means where you have an individual or a family who is being served who meets the criteria regardless of where they actually live. Low to moderate housing, spot blight, I love that phrase. It's just like, like real, I try to explain that one to people at work and they look at me so funny. Uh, and so that's like a specific place. So all the things that we look at are trying to address uh, some number of those. And so one of the things we talked about in particular, for instance, we looked at curb cuts, which we've been funding for a while for which the intent of, um, uh, you know, helping with the disability, in particular disabled people, persons, but also for, you know, strollers and everything like that. We placed those in census zones that meet the criteria. And one of the questions we had was, are there 
enough places, having done you know dozens and dozens of curve cuts. And um, Julie brought in Adam K, Adam Karowski, who put up a map, and we looked at all of the curb cuts in the zones, both in and out, and the answer is we have plenty <laughs> of curb cuts uh, that need to uh, still be done. And uh, But even beyond that, there are also things like we'll be able to do where like the complete streets corridor, so that there's support that we're gonna be, that are also within the, the appropriate census tract. So we've got uh, work there. So we spent a fair amount of time um, looking at that. We uh, are definitely, there's definitely a change that we're making looking at the, um, the, low, the the rehab housing program and uh, Jenny's working on uh, some uh, changes in like how that service is being delivered so that there's a change in the in the bottom line on that one uh, the public services which as you recall are very carefully limited by our federal grant about how much money we can actually put we essentially level funded everybody uh, you know some of the, the I think there's a couple hundred bucks here or there that went up or down but fundamentally we didn't get any new applicants and none of the existing applicants, none of their situations had changed so much that you know our math uh, differed significantly. And uh, I guess my last thing to say is is that the you know press rumors, as I guess the way to describe it, say that uh, Trump's budget zeroes out CDBG. Right. Yeah, and so there we when we wrote this, we definitely had in, uh, so we often, when we start doing this process, we often get the letter from the federal government telling us what our appropriation is going to be for this year. And this year they informed Julie that, you know, we don't know when that's coming. Sure. And so we still don't have that letter. We still don't actually know what the amount is. And uh, if, and when we were doing our consideration, we said, okay, you know, what happens if it gets cut? And we'd like worked through a little bit of a cut list I'd say we'd made it down through about a, you know, a third of the budget, and then basically we said, well, we we're not going to worry about it too much. And so, if it really comes in at a zero, we're going to have to have a, you know, a deeper discussion. Both, the, like at this group and the town manager, I'm, I'm sure is going to have to because there are some of these things that uh, we can't replace. So, Steve, I don't know. Yeah, that, no, that covered um, quite a bit of what I had jotted down. Um, I would just like to definitely thank um, Julie and uh, Jenny. This, um, I think. Our process here of the subcommittee is um, really taking steps uh, toward a certain amount of professionalism o over the past two years, and, and it's something I, I've, um, it's very noticeable and it's um, you know very helpful to us as we have these discussions. Um, I think the curb cut example that Dan um, talked about earlier is a great example of that, and particularly the you know collaboration throughout town departments is um, very much appreciated mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, the, for the public service and the level funding, um, that's not something I, I was expecting um, going into this conversation, um, but uh, it's something I think we're all very happy that we were able to accomplish. Um, you know, we, yeah, I think that we know how important all of those programs are to our most vulnerable population in town. And um, yeah, it, it's something that I, I was happy that we were able to do. Um, and on to the, you know, uh, proposed budget by the Trump administration. I mean, you know, I, I think it um, further shows his, you know, ineptness when it comes to programs that support local governments, and, and it's something that we'll be paying uh, particular attention to. And we certainly hope that that is um, not the case. So, I think that's everything I, I have to share here. Thank you. And in, in, along that vein, um, <clears throat> I know. Um, We've all gotten, um, I forwarded on, and I apologize, whoever I sent it to, that they are, have gotten from the National League of Cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors that um, spoke to President Trump's um, vetoing or eliminating the CDBG program. I'm going to leave it to the future chair um, in April, the CDBG subcommittee members, Jenny, town manager, and others, um, to sort of look at when I've gotten those notices, they've been kind of ambivalent. One group is saying current funding and one is saying future funding. So I'm going to leave it to everyone who's been working on the CDBG subcommittee to monitor that um, because I'm, I'm confused whether it's funding that we anticipate for what this subcommittee and the planning department have already approved or if it's the following year. So I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to let you all monitor that. And then once you see when you think that kick-in date is, then come back to 
the next chair in terms of sort of a, a framework of it's going to kick in for current, it's going to kick in for next year or, or whatever year, and then whatever um, process you want to set up in terms of evaluating that and, and, and where we can band-aid it and where we can't and how we, you know, because you all know you've sat on the CDBG subcommittee, you know, 98.8% of this, a lot of it is really social services needs, you know, whether it's administrative or actual services delivered. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that beyond what um, has already been stated, Mr. Burke. Um, I would, you know, I would add that while it is definitely a, you know, it, this causes a, quite a bit of concern. Um, you know, I think the president's budget is an opening salvo that really, you know, is more of a policy statement. Um, and it is something that, that could change. Um, it might have been, you know, I, I think that there's maybe less concern around losing federal funding for becoming a sanctuary city now that we know that he's taking it out. Yeah, he's trying to strip our local funding anyway. Um, but, but it is something we'll be following. And, and you know, I, I think it, you know, it will be interesting to see what happens with, you know, a uh, full Republican you know, Congress um, and whether or not they adopt his full budget, but it's something that we'll, we'll be keeping close eye on here. Mr. Carroll. Thank you. And I did want to just, um, well, first thank Mr. Dunn and, and uh, Mr. Byrne for ably representing the board and mm -hmm. the manager and Julie for all of your hard work and everyone else who worked on this. I know these are tough decisions, um, and I did really appreciate that um, first page, you know, laying out scenarios if, if um, incremental cuts were to come. It, it kills me to think that this could be our last CDBG vote ever. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even believe it, but there are a lot of things I can't believe. Um, <laughs> there are a lot, of, a lot of things I can't believe. I just want to remind folks, too, that, you know, uh, about a month, month and a half ago, we were, you know, we debated about sending a letter of communication and whatnot, and we did send a communication to our federal and state delegations and, and the governor just talking about a lot of the things that Arlington does and ways that we partner with the federal and state governments. And we did highlight CDBG in there. So um, we have kind of put that forward before this news came down that this could potentially be, be a reality. So um, that, that is on the radar. Um, I know Mr. Grill, you probably remind us all if he were here that, that there was a lot of effort was was put into bringing Arlington under the CDBG um, uh, umbrella um, for a, a town to, to come under that umbrella it was a big big deal and it's been a big deal to a lot of people in this town. That was Tip O'Neill. Yeah. Help spearhead it. Um, Julie, did we cover? <clears throat> did we cover everything? Um, yes, I believe so. Um, on a motion. Madam Chair, oh. this is a vote that the um, town manager has a vote. Oh, that's right. I think I have it as, as a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Uh, no, I think. Uh, motion no. by Mr. Ver who, who makes the motion? I don't oh, know if the motion was actually oh. made oh, yet. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Notice, I think I took whoever's vote. Okay, who would like to? Does the manager get to make a motion? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chapterlane, would you like to move? <laughs> Probably best I do. Okay, a mo motion by? So moved. Mr. Second. Dunn. Actually, sir, I'm, I'm going to move that we adopt this uh, budget for the CDBG uh, pending the receipt of a letter from the federal government and uh, pa and make this you know recommendation to town manager for their uh, excuse me to town meeting for their consideration motion by mr. Dunn seconded by Second. mr. Byrne in order to accurately reflect in our final votes and comments so we just take a voice vote or a roll call I think of, since we're including the town manager I think a voice votes fine madam chair okay um, all those in favor of motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne, unless there's any further questions or comments, say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote, and our vote should reflect that. Mr. Chaplain also voted in the affirmative. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank yes, you. Hope Thank so. Julie. I keep saying Julie. Why did I do that? I'm sorry. I have a sister-in-law, Julie. We say Jewel. Um, and we now go to uh, Article 30. Should we take 30 and 31 together since they both involve a, a bylaw amendment revolving fund or should we take them separately? Um, they may need separate votes, but uh, I think we can discuss them together, Madam Chair. Okay, um, is it Mr. Chapelain or our comptroller? Let's see. Or Mr. Mr. Attorney Hein? Who's, who wants to start this off and turn over to the next person? Sure. Um, well, I, Madam Chair, well, I think the uh, comptroller is gonna present um, more specific 
information with respect to uh, what our plans are once a revolving fund bylaw is created. Um, this is another feature of the Municipal Modernization Act that attempts to simplify the process for the establishment and use of certain departmental expenditures which can be made without um, further appropriation. Um, when they, especially when, they de when they're derived from a specific source of revenues. So right now our uh, revolving funds have to be reestablished prior to each fiscal year by a town meeting vote. Uh, but if we approve a revolving fund bylaw, we'll essentially have a, set, a list of what all of our revolving funds are, what their purposes are, and what departments are basically administering them um, so that we don't necessarily need to do anything other than uh, annually reauthorize the total amount of the budget. So um, the Department of Revenue has some very specific language that they recommend with respect to three quarters of what would go into our bylaw. And they sort of offer an option in terms of how we want to present the list of revolving funds um, themselves, which I think the manager and the comptroller have had some discussions about. But that's essentially the gist of what we're, what we're doing is we're approving a new bylaw that will go into Article 1 uh, that'll contain all of our revolving funds. And after this is approved by the Attorney General's office, we essentially won't need to have quite as much uh, uh, administration of revolving funds every year at town meeting. Just a, a procedural question on that. Say f three, four, five years out, um, it's inc every year it's been incorporated if it passes in Article 1. If someone does have a query, would they be directed to, once Article 1 is on the table, to <coughs> raise their hand to the moderator? Or, I mean, how do they notify if somebody in future years actually does have something that they need information or have a question on? Mr. Chapterling? So the, the, as I see it, and I'll let town council tell me if I'm, I'm mistaken on this, we're, we're still gonna basically have the exact same discussion at town meeting as we currently have, except the usage uh, and guidance over the revolving funds will be codified in bylaw. But the, the, the data that the comptroller currently provides will still be before the Board of Selectmen every year to reauthorize not necessarily the fund, but the expenditures itself, which is to some degree semantics. Yeah, to be, to be frank, I mean, Arlington follows some pretty uh, good practices with respect to how it administers all of this stuff already. So some of this stuff is a little bit cosmetic, but one of the nice features of it is it will be codified again in our bylaws, which um, departments have which revolving funds, and we'll really only be talking about the amounts every year. When I say Article 1, I'm sorry, I mean Article 1 of the, uh, of the town bylaws, Title 1. My apologies. So yeah, it'll, 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 it'll be before town meeting every year in, in a similar way, but we just won't have to actually technically reauthorize. So it. is it incorporated into Article 1 or is it Title 1? So it, may I'm sorry. So yeah, I, what, what, what'll happen is now there, there are initial votes of town meeting, could be decades ago, that say what a revolving fund can be spent on. Then each year we have had town meeting via a vote of this board, just reauthorize the amounts. And then if there ever needed to be a change in what it can be spent, there has to be another vote of town meeting changing it. And it's, frankly, I'll admit it, it it's a little tough to track what the, te what the revolving fund could be spent on because you have to go find that town meeting vote. It's not, it's not in the bylaw. You can't just go look up, you know, there's the revolving fund. Uh, you have to go find a vote from 2003, you know, Article 32, you know, whatever it might be. So here we'll have a few things. We'll have right in t Title I of the bylaws a list, probably in chart form, private ways to be spent upon X in just that description. And that will live in the bylaws. And if it ever needs to be amended, we'll have to file uh, a warrant article to amend that portion of the bylaws. However, absent any need to amend that, every year there will still be that authorization <coughs> to spend that comes before the, both the board and then town meeting, as has always been the case. Am I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to be to, to be clear. Is that no, no, it, <clears throat> it is. And I'm just thinking of past three, four years. The the only one that's sort of a common denominator that fluctuates fl fluctuates as well as I get questions on is um, I don't want to say town hall rentals, but the yeah, revolving rental, fund yeah. for that, where that isn't so as static as some of the other ones. What you're telling me is that it may be a different way to get there but we'll still get via the comptroller the same report that we get for i don't want to say town hall rentals it's called, it's called town hall rentals. oh it is yeah. okay yeah. so so we'll still have that information in terms of um money in money out and if somebody wants to say did, did the money from town hall rentals you know did you come out in the black and did that money actually get spent on um 
upgrading, maintaining town hall. It'll that information will still be there. Um, correct That's on that. Correct. Mr. Dunn? So uh, this definitely helps uh, me understand more about what the change we're talking about is. Does this have the effect of making a new revolving fund require a two-thirds vote? Because changing the because if we're changing the revolving, you said revolving funds, you'd say it'd be in a table form in the bylaw. And typically, bylaw changes two-thirds, right? No. no? Only, only zoning. Oh, zoning. Ah, see, this is where I, I screwed up. Sorry. Thank you. It's okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Carroll, did you? Well, I was just, just going to say, so my, my, my reading of this is, um, so there's some draft language in, in here uh, for us to take a look at. But it looks like most of that is, it doesn't really change much of what we're doing. The, the real meat is this placeholder down at the bottom with the authorized revolving funds, and it says here that that'll actually specify the reporting requirements for each fund, right? So correct. That's correct. We could tweak that. Okay. Great. If I could ask our comptroller to name and position for the record and try to clean this up for us. I know we've kind of, well, uh, I, I know I've sent it off in different directions. Sure, happy to do so. Uh, Richard Visca, comptroller. Thank you for having me. Um, I do want to um, add on a little bit to what um, Adam and uh, Tago said is uh, what the way I read it is that this has to be authorized by the legislative body every year. Now by enacting this bylaw and actually really uh, reconciling exactly what these funds are to be used for, the sources of revenue and the way we expend them. It's basically, like Tom Andrew said, you kind of take some of this old information and you're really bring it into 2018 and we'll have a really clear cut source and use of the funds. And every year we will not have to come before the legislative body to enact it because it'll be a bylaw. We will just go before the town meeting to authorize the spending limit of such funds. So uh, I'll be working with uh, Doug and um, Adam to uh, bring in a chart. And again, there's a bullet point version and there's kind of a spreadsheet version. I tend to like the spreadsheets, go figure, right? Um, so we're <laughs> gonna try to get all that information um, packaged up to bring before you to um, codify these. There is, um, it, it is allowed to do it in the, the same manner we've done in past years. So we're before you now just to give you the summary of expenditures from fiscal year 16, which we, uh, I've submitted to you and uh, also fiscal year 18 spending limitations and um, begin to fund balance and I think fund balance of the past fiscal year. So I'm happy to answer questions on any of those. I think the 16 funds total, no new funds there and uh, pretty much the same as it's been from the last fiscal year. I think we tweaked one by $20,000 of an increased budget because we almost hit that threshold on, uh, I believe it was the town hall rentals from 100,000 to 120,000. So. Otherwise, it looks pretty similar to what we did last year. And again, we have a detail of the expenditures for you and a summary of fund balance. So again, happy to answer any questions for you. Um, you may not know this off the top of your head and I may be remembering incorrectly. For some reason I thought, maybe my colleagues will remember this, I thought this town meeting or the year before, there was money approved for the Uncle Sam um, fund committee or am I not remembering that correctly? Just because I look at Uncle Sam fees, it's, it's just zero flat line. Have they ever had any money ex uh, sent to that or? We've appropriated money for Uncle Sam, but that's accounted for as an appropriation. It's not included in the report. Yeah, I've seen some appropriation, tell me, but we've had, I, I haven't seen any income come into this particular revolving fund since, since I've been here, so uh, no, no activity. You'll notice there's some that have a, a lot of activity and some that right. have relatively uh, little, uh, in some cases, none at all, but. Um, so long as those funds are um, received and used for the uh, proper for that revolving fund, we'll make sure it routes in and, and stays with that fund. Okay. So if I wanted to, um, and I have no issue with the Uncle Sam committee being given funds from town meeting, but um, similar to like when I, I and others have said, with CDBG getting the half year report to see if somebody hasn't spent the money and doesn't plan to spend it on that. But if I wanted to uh, get a report of that. It's not through revolving funds. It would be a request. Like if I wanted to say, okay, town meeting appropriated, I think twenty five hundred or. I'd, ha I'd have to check that. I'd, it was a few years ago, I think, the yeah. last time Uncle Sam got. We have money. the records of all expenditures. So if you need any expenditure, whether it's an appropriation. Don't do any exhaustive, cumbersome search. But if it's something you can click through Munis or whatever, I'm just curious. Um, and if they haven't spent it, that's fine too. But my thing would be, if they haven't spent it, I would just say to a member or two, you know, hey, you, do you guys know you have this money? Do you plan on doing it? And you probably shouldn't come back for more if you haven't spent it yet. So this is just me curiosity. So if it's something you can do that's not cumbersome mm -hmm. or an exhaustive search, 
um, and I'll give you a call like in a week yeah, or two. Yeah, just I'm, let me I'm know. I'm just curious. Just, and only because when I went through the list of expenditures, I saw Uncle Sam zero, money in, money out. That's why. Yeah, we can check the history of the appropriations. If there was an appropriation in the general fund, those funds would be closed out on June 30, just like all general fund appropriations. So if there were funds and they weren't expended, most likely they were closed out. They become far to free cash. But I'll do some research and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll go back too far historically. But I'm sure Adam can help me uh, navigate to where those funds may have been appropriated. In, in the difference between the two Warren articles, one is revolving fund in general, and the other one is revolving fund for departments. Is that why they're separated? So, if Turning I may, time? well, one is to create a bylaw, which is how we'll proceed with revolving funds in the future, oh. and the other is basically our standard Warren article that we do every year because until that bylaw is approved, we still need to reauthorize the funds and That's right. report on the expenditures. Mr. Dunn? Um, I guess. I will move approval on recommendation of the new bylaw under Article 30. Second. Moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne. <clears throat> Any further questions or comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote on Article 30, Article 31. I move approval on Article 31 with the uh, revolving funds with the, knowing that we're going to continue the updated uh, descriptions and, and amounts that we've put in the last couple of years. Seconded by Second. Mr. Carroll. Anyone else here to speak to, to Article 31? Any questions or comments? If not, on Article 31, a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Carroll. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Have those opposed? The unanimous vote. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. Are you here for a particular item or no? Oh, no, that's fine. I was going to say, that's, you're welcome to say the very end. I just wanted to make sure, because I've been jumping around the agenda. If there was something else you were waiting for, I'd take it out of order. I'm also interested in the noise. Discussed both of oh, those. Oh, we did that. We voted favorable action on all those. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, a final votes and comments. Is it my understanding, or I'll, I'll ask for my colleagues, are we voting everything except for Article 59, or are we ready? Mr. Dunn? Uh, I had a chance to read everything over, mm -hmm. over on my way to the meeting today, and I'm ready to move forward on all of them. I'd like an opportunity to take another swing at the comment on number 19, which is the town treasurer. Mm -hmm. uh, we really have to, uh, I believe, really lay out our case in this, because I mean, it, it has been controversial in the past. And so, uh, with the board's indulgence, I, I, I'm I'm happy to move approval of final votes and comments on 15. Oh, sorry, 15, 18, is it 15 20, 20, or is it 13? Mm -hmm. 15, LB, GTQIA, 18, treasure is 19. So we're going to uh, take that out. We've got we've got a discontinuity there, Doug. And 15 says Article 15 in one place, then it says Article 13 in the actual language. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. That so it says Article 15. Uh, it, that's the warrant article, and then it's Article 15 under Title Two will be the new bylaw. All right, I was wrong. Article 15. All right, I move approval. 15, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 60. And I ask the board's second. indulgence for uh, 19. Yep. Second. Okay, and a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Carroll, to move approval, Article 15, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 60. Uh, any further questions or comments? One second. If not, I'll uh, one second. And it's, it's my understanding that right now we're holding final votes and comments on Articles 19 and 59. Yes. Yes, Madam Chair. If I may, I, I, I just want to. I just. I understand that Article 59 is, is is very important to get right, and that the chair recorded a number of important questions that I want to continue to work on, making sure those answers are polished and refined, as well as working with the Human Rights Commission folks further, who have been terrific throughout this whole process. So I'll make sure to have a, the vote and comment for you at our next meeting. Uh, but it, it, I'm sorry, it's taking a little time on that one. No, no, definitely. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm ready. Okay. Um, on a motion by M Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kiro. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. And do, do I just procedurally need to ask for a motion to table Article 19 and 59, or they just stay there? I'm, I'm happy to have them just stay there. I don't think they need to be formally tabled, Madam Chair. Okay, so then with that, we will go back to the consent agenda with my colleague's permission. Minutes of meetings, February 27, 2017, for approval, free parking, Saturday, March 18, 2017, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. on the Russell Common Lot and Railroad Lot Lamson Way, just driveway by Not Your Average Joe's, for Civics Day, 
from the Civic State Planning Committee, request special one-day all-alcohol license, March 25th, 2017, Dearborn Academy, 34 Winter Street, for Leslie Ellis School Spring Party Financial Assistance, a request special one-day all-alcohol license on April 8th, 2017, at the Robbins Memorial Town Hall Auditorium for the Waldorf School of Lexington, their spring benefit, <coughs> and a request for a contractor dra drain layer license, Feeney Brothers Excavation, LLC, out of Dorchester, Masses, Mass, is a motion to approve by... Mr. Burns, seconded by? Second. Mr. Dunn. Um, any questions on Mr. Dunn? Uh, I just wanted to commend Mr. Sullivan on the minutes for that meeting. It was a long meeting, and there was a lot of stuff said, and I thought you really captured it uh, well, and a really, uh, you know, it was very readable, and I think you really got the meeting. So, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. And um, seeing no one else here, on a motion by Mr. Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. We now will go to <coughs> traffic rules and order. Listen to that Boston accent. Order. Order. <laughs> Other business, a vote. Um, approve the committee scope and proposed membership for the surveillance committee. Mr. Chapterline, our town manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in follow up to the board's vote of no action on Article 21, uh, but a commitment to form a um, a study committee, I met with the article proponent, Steve Revelak, last week. Uh, we came up with an agreement on what the proposed scope would be, as well as what the preferred membership or proposed membership would be. Uh, I drafted this memo, uh, shared it with him. He was on board with it and thanked the board for their cooperation on this matter. And I would just ask for your consideration of approval tonight so that we could then put out a, um, put out a solicitation for residents and form the committee and have them get to work. Okay. Is there a motion by... Move approval. Mr. Dunn, seconded by? Second. Mr. Byrne. Um, was there, I didn't write down Mr. Byrne, I'm sorry. Um, when, we, when we discussed this particular warrant item article, we voted no action. I have a vague memory, and I'm just kind of running on fumes at this point, in terms of there was some discussion about either contact or interface or communication with the Arlington Housing Authority. There was some discussion around Arlington Housing Authority. Yeah, so I, I put, into the, in there and I I put into the proposed scope that it is also proposed that the committee review the use of surveillance technology by the Arlington Housing Authority with the understanding that the town does not have jurisdiction over this agency. Okay. And that's in, is that in that me in memo in front of me? Yeah, right oh, in the it's third in proposed line. scope. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I see what you're saying. And my question would be, Right now, none of that has been established or followed up on because first you need this vote of approval to approve this structure, and then that will be one of the next steps, the or has there already been communication? I, I have not pursued any communication. Uh, Attorney Hine. And Madam Chair, if I may add, uh, Mr. Revelek's also been in communication with me. Uh, they've actually had some success in starting a dialogue with the Arlington Housing Authority, so they have been responsive to speaking with the citizens who brought forth this article, and our work would be building upon that. Okay, thank you. Okay, and a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Any further discussions? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. We will now go to Article 10, which is a vote to authorize the town manager to no negotiate purchase and sale for 1207 Mass Ave. Mr. Byrne? Um, I am going to recuse myself from this discussion. Thank you. If Mrs. Sullivan could note that Mr. Byrne is temporarily exiting the meeting at 8.02 p.m., when we're starting article agenda item 10. I'm just gonna wait one second. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what the board has before it tonight uh, is a memorandum drafted by myself, uh, the RFP that was initially issued for the sale of 1207 Mass Ave, as well as the one bid that was received for the property. Uh, the board may recall at the last meeting uh, I had provided the board with a memo that outlined that uh, myself, town council, and uh, the director of planning and community development had reviewed the bid uh, or the proposal and found that it met all the minimum quality criteria or the minimum criteria, uh, but that I needed a member of the board to sit with me and pr uh, provide an analysis or review of the comparative criteria. The board designated Selectman Greeley. We met last week to do that scoring. Um, we both agreed uh, on a score out of a 15 out of a total uh, possible 18 points. Uh, the proposal met the minimum price. 
it met the criteria we wanted for mixed use with a 40-year deed restriction, um, and did would have some ab impacts in the neighborhood through construction redevelopment, so we couldn't give it a, a no impact score. Uh, but based upon all of that, I recommend that the board uh, accept this bid subject to all of the conditions that are set forth in the RFP and then authorize me to negotiate with uh, the bidder on a purchase and sale agreement. And then if we can come to terms, I'll come back before the board for an actual official approval of the purchase and sale agreement. Is my memory cor correct in one of these documents you provided to us that the proposed use is a similar mixed use or is in conformity with the master plan, master plan study committee recommendations? It is. It's, it's a proposal to, to do a mixed use, which would have retail on the first level, on the, on the sidewalk level, and then have either a housing use, an apartment or condo use, or po possibly even a boutique hotel use uh, on the floors above uh, the first floor. So it is, it is completely in conformance with our want to spread mixed use on the commercial corridors. And if I can ask this question, if it's not appropriate, please please tell me, or if we even know, um, I'm just thinking of new businesses on along the business corridor. Is there any indication um, in terms of the proposed mixed use, recognizing nothing's firm, but in terms of, I'm thinking of when businesses open up, and especially in East Arlington, and they say, you know, I know I had three parking spaces, but three or four other businesses are counting those exact same spaces. Are there any parking waivers, uh, uh, parking variance exemptions or something in terms of the development, or am I getting ahead of myself? So I, I wouldn't propose that we give any parking waivers. I don't, I don't know that we even could as part of the, the purchase and sale, and the, dis, uh, the discussion about parking would be before the ARB when a special permit is being pursued. Sorry. Yes. Mr. Dunn? Um, I wish we got more bidders and I wish we got more money, yeah. uh, but we did the RFP and this is, you know, we, we wrote what we wanted and, uh, you know, it, it met the minimum. So uh, I'm ready to make, um, move approval and ask, and ask the town manager to enter the negotiations uh, that he envisions. I'll second that. Moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kiro, and I anticipate that uh, your need for a member of the Board of Selectmen, that that has now ended because that has been fulfilled. So right. I. We'll make a point to thank Mr. Greeley for um, when the query initially came to me, um, he agreed to do that in my state, and I do appreciate that. Any further questions or comments on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kiro? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, unanimous vote. <clears throat> I just need a quick one. I've got to open up my calendar, right? Oh, God. And what I was thinking was um, asking Mrs. Sullivan how far ahead she would like us to go, do that, and then um, the next incoming chair can pick up from there. We, just started, we decided to restart the process. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So it's now 8.07 p.m. Um, we have the full four-member board. We're moving on to agenda item 11, discussion, future board of selectmen's meeting. I, what I wanted to do was do the bare minimum <laughs> in terms of if I could ask Mrs. Sullivan, um, how far ahead should we go to let the selectmen's office to be able to schedule business go May and June and stop there so that the income, or do you want us to go further than June? Does that sound right to everyone that we go out to June? Because mm -hmm. yeah. right now, our last meeting that we have scheduled is the organizational meeting in April. That's it. You're right. So we're on. We need on generally, and it's mostly licenses. Mm -hmm. We need a month out, you know, a month and a half even. Um, and we're entering into now on a big period for the outside cafe. <coughs> and, you know, I'm going to need some meeting dates. My vice chairman, who's <laughs> I don't know how to pull up the calendar part of it. Yeah. Could you take oh, this part of it? Yep. What, what, our next scheduled so meeting is April. Our is April 3rd. Okay, so if you yep. can take it from there. So we're we're gonna gonna we've got April 3rd, meeting. and then town meeting starts the 24th, right? Last Monday. Of, yep. That's the last Monday. So we will probably need a meeting between the 3rd and the 24th, I think. Is 17th that? is Patriots Day. Oh, yeah, so that narrows that down. It's either the 10th or the 24th. That does, so the April 10th? 
Okay. Tenth. And then obviously, so the 10th, uh, April 10th, mm -hmm. and then on April 24th, we'll meet <coughs> before town meeting. So, and town meeting starts at eight. Uh, so I guess maybe we might need a six o'clock meeting on the 24th, okay. but we can just set the time. The chair will be able to set the time as we get closer. Why don't we say now, let's kind of maybe plan yep. on six, yeah. Okay. So sorry, I'm writing this down. So we got the tenth. Uh, you said the twenty-fourth. So yes, yeah, so we're doing the tenth as a regular meeting. At seven fifteen. Twenty-fourth is okay. six o'clock. Yeah, twenty-fourth at six p.m. And then, uh, so then we're obviously we're continuing through town meeting. Uh, we can and we can meet like since we're all here on Mondays, you know, as it is. I don't know, but if we want to set one for the eighth, or do we? Do we usually only do them every two weeks during town meeting? Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd go for the eighth to give some time. You do yeah. have three in April though. Right. Uh, yes. Okay. I just yep. want to make sure. Okay. So May 8th, uh, and then the calendar would say May 22nd, but I'm going to say that I'm not available that day, which is okay. But so, so we're calling that. Uh, nor will I be. A six o'clock one on May 8th. Uh, how how lucky are we feeling? Gonna, yeah, you're right. That's yeah. that'll be uh, the no, fifth, not that lucky. That's the fifth night. Yeah. 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 All right. So, but we don't. Do we need a six o'clock even then? Um, why don't we set it for that in case we get right. a lot yeah. of common VICs or? We can even do 6.30. Okay. 6.30 allows me to take a, mm. it just helps. Should we have done that on the 24th as well? Um, it, depending on the agenda, I, I'm happy to do it, but if it's not too heavy on the agenda. I'm the same thing, if we can get. If, if we can get away right. with so let's call it, so 24, so back on April 24th, let's call that 6.30. 6 okay. And on May 8th, let's call it 6.30. And then it sounds like two of us are not available on May 22nd, and May 29th is Memorial Day, so May 15th. Mm -hmm. What time? Uh, by then, probably we'll probably well, talk about it. We go back We're to hopefully time. done by then. Yeah, yeah. Let's call it. Let's let's be optimistic and say 7:15. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> and then see how it goes. Thank you, where you're sitting. Uh, June. And then. So then that will mean that we won't have met the two weeks in June, so, or in May, so June 5th is probably preferable. Mm. All right. And, um, pardon me, and then we've got the options of the 12th, 19th, and 26th. Those all look the same to me. So 19 or 26? Yeah, I think 19th just on 19th the tip. Would be yeah. Better for me. Okay, let's call it June 19th, 7:15. Um, I'm, I'm kind of scared to ask this question, but I have in my head. I know what you're gonna ask. Do we have? Is there something we traditionally do in June? On a Saturday. On the a Saturday routine. that yes. we have I, to do. I don't. I, I don't think we think about that till after town meeting normally, but if we want to pick a Saturday. <laughs> no, but I'm just, no, I'm just saying, no, you don't have, we don't have to pick the Saturday. I'm just saying, is that something that happens every year? So for me to anticipate in June, we're going to be doing I'd that because like I'm too. always so excited and thrrilled to go to that. Y yes, I would like. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be sucky. Is last that our goals year. meeting? Is that yes, your goals, goals, goals meeting, meeting or is it combined? Combined. Yeah. Goals. So it'll be combined. So I guess. I can tell you, I can already tell you that I prefer the third or the 17th of June. If that's jumping the gun, but so why don't we leave that with the town manager and whoever the next incoming chair is? Um, and I'm fine with what third and what 17th, third and 17th, um, with the same format that we usually have, yep. which is in the morning. Okay. So we'll leave it to the incoming chair and the town manager. Sure, okay. um, I would just say, um, if that can be kind of um, firmed up, I'm, trying, I'm saying the wrong word, nailed down in May. Um, yeah, just so, yeah. you know. Madam Chair, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we will go to correspondence received. There's a motion to move receipt by. So moved. Mr. Burns, seconded by. Second. Mr. Carroll, we have one piece of correspondence. Any questions, comments, action? If not, a motion by Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Carroll. All those in favor? Oh. Yeah, I'll just make the comment that the, by the, the bylaw says that uh, this committee should send us their proposal for comment. So if we wish to make comment, that is our. And I know um, I've had, and others have had conversations, um, and I felt comfortable 
not asking them to come in as an agenda item, which we could do that. Mm -hmm. And if, if anybody else on the board had indicated that, we'd be happy to schedule that. And if in the future um, any member of this board or otherwise would like to have that as an agenda item, they can work with the new chair. Um, but it, just in compliance with the law, uh, the correspondence sent, um, I think we fulfilled everything so far to date. Yeah. So on a motion by Mr. Burns, second by Mr. Cura, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, unanimous vote. Okay, Marie, I'm doing pretty good. She's watching us from home, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> we now go to new business, Mrs. Sullivan. Uh, no new business. Attorney Heim. No new business, Madam Chair. Our town manager, Mr. Chapterlane, I don't know if you have any snow update or if we're still. I do. Thank you. I do. Uh, so two, two pieces of new business, one related to snow. Uh, over, earlier in the meeting, uh, you allowed me a chance to give a few snow updates. Since then, the governor has announced he's closing all state offices tomorrow, so we're doing the same for town offices in the library. Town website has been adjusted accordingly, and an email has gone out. Uh, moving so when you say that, it's, of course, police, fire, DPW, emergency personnel will be reporting. Of course. Thank you. Of course, yes. Um, Moving away from that, uh, very good news that I know I, I shared with the board at the end of last week. Uh, the town is going to be the recipient of a $500,000 small municipal bridge grant from Mass DOT. Uh, this would, is for the small bridge on Mystic Street over the Mill Brook near the police station. Um, without this grant, we would have been waiting a couple years. We would have been putting some temporary measures in place until we could fit it into the capital plan to do a bridge replacement. Receiving the funds this year will allow us to start design immediately and replace the bridge over the course of probably the next 18 months uh, and be able to avoid uh, most of those temporary expenditures. So just a, a huge testament to the work of the DPW engineering planning, uh, not specifically in this issue, but TAC as well for just some tremendous transportation infrastructure work over the past year or so and beyond. Uh, but just in a year's time, a $400,000 complete streets grant and a $500,000 small bridge grant, which are, without question, this is money that will allow local resources to go to other important local projects that otherwise would have had to wait. So this is just, it's a very good thing for the town, and I wanted to uh, So if we had to note. pay this expenditure out of the town budget, where would it come from, Chapter we probably would have had a, taken a combination of Chapter 90 and existing roadway funds, which means less roads would have been paved in Arlington for the next two or three years. So receiving this funds, uh, these funds mean we can do this project and continue to pave other roads in Arlington, which is, which is a good thing. I don't know if it's allowed or beneficial in terms of announcing this either currently or in the future, um, especially since I know there's been some concerns around, you know, rebuilding, renovating Arlington High School, the school budget, the town budget, a possible override, um, whatever appropriate forum, maybe it's just verbally, but if it's somehow in writing also, that could kind of show a synopsis that if we had not received this grant through DPW's efforts and others of $500,000, this would have taken money from this portion of the town budget. J just to um, demonstrate to people that um, your department heads and others are doing everything they can to um, try to find outside funding. That's one of the things when we talked about the debt exclusion and, and previous overrides that making a commitment not to come back for a certain amount of years, which we're getting kind of closer to. We've already gone beyond that, but, but as well as I think it's good to point out that you know through the efforts, we would have had to take so much from Chapter 90, which meant, means roadways and, and public streets and whatever. Um, but thankfully, because of that, like we're doing everything we can to do, you know. So I'll, I'll leave that to you in terms yeah, no, of I, I maybe hear, it's when you do your report to town meeting or your budget or whatever. Yep, I think that's well stated. Not well stated, but thank you. Well received. Yeah, yeah. I know I'm all over. Did you say two things or? Those were my two things. Oh, so two things. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Burns. No new business. Mr. Curo. No new business. Mr. Dunn. One item uh, last week went to the audit committee meeting. And uh, the number of us were over in the Lions uh, hearing room. Uh, two takeaways, I think, that are worth mentioning to this board. One is, so we all know, and I'm going to say some things that everyone here knows, but people at home might not, which is uh, we contribute every year to the retirement pension fund, which we are not fully funded at. And uh, we have not fully funded that liability, and so we pay you know, enough such that we will be able to be done. Our goal is 2033, if I remember right. We carry that liability on our balance sheet, the stuff that we haven't met. And we also have a separate benefit, which we call OPEB, which is other post-employment benefits, which is the health care for our retirees. 
and the, we have we are much less we are far far farther behind in terms of paying for our OPEB liability, and those are treated differently from an accounting perspective. In starting next year, the accounting perspective will say no. You have to you look at them actually the same, which is to say that Arlington's balance, which is currently a positive of about 26 million, will become a negative of about 120 million. So. Our balance sheet is going to abruptly look significantly worse, but it's worth mentioning now because it doesn't actually changing the state of affairs within the town and other towns are affected in the in cities are affected in the exact same way and in fact are often in worse situations than ours are. So it shouldn't affect. We don't, we have no expectation that it can affect our bond rating or anything like that. But nonetheless, if you're someone who reads balance sheets closely, you're going to be somewhat startled by. Uh, not what you see in this year's town report, but by in next year's town report. And the second item that I was going to wanted to mention is that uh, the management letter was very thin and very good, but it did have one thing that was an update. Not even something that we're in, we're not currently in a problem, but we have to do something this year to avoid a problem next year, which is to comply with the new federal standards for all the federal funds that we receive. Is we have to document all of our compliance procedures. And there's like this 18 step like thing about like this is how you do compliance. And the general opinion was this is mostly stuff that we do already, but we need to formally adopt those. And so I asked the, comp the comptroller is kind of the person probably most leading up and he needs support from the schools, the treasurer and so on. And so I asked him to come forward in, in um, probably before June, I think he said he was going to come forward and talk about the progress and the steps that, that are necessary to implement those controls. That is the report from, not the other, uh, yeah, no, I'm going to bite my tongue on that one. All right, that's my report. <laughs> <laughs> on that, okay. I'll start with that. New yes. Um, just very briefly, uh, since our meeting that, uh, that we had at the last Board of Selectmen meeting, um, I've had quite a few people that have complimented the board in terms of the last Warren article hearings that we had down at Town Hall. Um, it, heard nothing but positive from pros, cons, and still undecided on all of the Warren article hearings, meetings, and that they appreciated um, every member of the board um, in terms of how that went. The only uh, adjunct to that, which even this past Saturday night, I was talking to a few people, and I know the word will continue to get out. There was a little bit of confusion, and maybe it's because I uh, called the moderator at the beginning of the meeting, but. It wasn't necessarily there for the debate. The decision when um, town meeting gets to the sanctuary town warrant article um, to have to ask each side, assuming there's only two sides, maybe the undecided wants to side also, to organize before town meeting and that there will be 10 minutes allotted for each side. That is purely a decision of the town moderator. That is nothing that this board discussed, voted on, approves, disapproves of. Um, the reason I called on the uh, town moderator was because he asked as a courtesy um, and that was basically giving him the opportunity to, to get the information out. So a few people were kind of confused that that was the, the parameters that this board um, had has set up um, and I honestly didn't know what the announcement was going to be, nor should I or anybody else because there's nothing nefarious about it. But I just want to clear up that that was not a... Um, Board of Selectmen, town manager, or anybody else um, uh, decision that's purely and solely within the purview and in his right as town moderator to set up those parameters. So any questions around that, um, email, contact the town moderator before town meeting or whenever you think is appropriate. So, And again, I'm not casting any aspersions either way. It's not our decision. We didn't decide it, and that's for him to do. The... Um, I'll save the good news for last. So um, I think all members of the board, just where you're talking about um, the money on Mill Street, Mystic, Mill Street Bridge over Mystic Street, received correspondence from Mr. Schlickman regarding signage that he feels might be inappropriate down there, outdated. Did you get, did everybody get that on the board? Or? Okay. I didn't. We okay, didn't so make. you're aware of that. Okay, because I saw Mr. Schlickman on Sunday night at a different event. <laughs> and he brought that up and I told him I thought that had been passed on. The other thing is for the incoming, the next chair of the uh, Board of Selectmen, again talking to Mr. Schlickman and um, in terms of in the future, um, I think our colleague Mr. Kiro kind of has gauged it correctly that there 
seems to be an appetite for um, in the future, possibly, you know, by the end of this year, especially with the Arlington High School project and others coming up, um, having a sort of joint uh, Board of Selectmen school committee meeting. Um, one of the things that I indicated that um, I would ask the current chair, I mean the future chair, to relate to the um, next chair coming in, which I believe appears to be Mr. Thielman, also would like to have conversations around um, the, the DOR report in terms of um, discussing their recommendations and seeing if there's any commonality there in terms of, you know, if we can both combine town and school to bid on product, products, like products and get a, best, a better um, price on it. Um, but definitely seemed like there was an appetite because I one of the things I said is none of us wants to have a meeting just to have a meeting to say that we had it. So I'll leave that to the future chair, but um, it seems as though that definitely was something well received. And lastly, I have volunteered Quasi volunteered my colleagues, all f four colleagues on the board and the town manager. Um, Arlington Eats had their fundraiser Saturday night. Um, I go to very few things just because of circumstances, and thankfully, my rest of my colleagues on the board are able to cover the other events. But this is something that's really near and dear to my heart, having grown up, you know rented apartments and then in the projects. And one of the worst things is, you know, when you kind of depend on school for your lunch and sometimes more snacks and then you get vacations and even worse summer vacations um f the fundraiser Arlington Eats Saturday night at town hall was fantastic unbelievable so well run I, everybody kn they know all the high-tech stuff um they were citing Lauren Ledger and Susan and others were citing 4,800 meals last year um and I know as someone that you know when school closed I was like oh my goodness I'm losing a really important meal there so it, it was uh, the extended, uh, invitation was extended and I said would be well received that um, they had asked in either July or August of this year that the uh, members of the Board of Selectmen and Town Manager come down um, and basically serve, be the servers of, of um, one of their kickoff meals that they have um, over the summertime for everybody. It's not a political thing and it's not going to go in a brochure or anything like that, but they thought, I said, do you really want us there? You know, maybe just want Adam and, you know, the police chief, but he, they said no, they thought, they thought if they could get the members of the board of selectmen and the town manager down there, they thought it would be a really good interface with the kids as well as with the adults. So quasi committed to July or August, I'll leave that to the town manager and the future chair, but I told them that of course, course would be willing to do that you know barring anyone's schedule like my husband when he has to go out and over to Japan and with that I will Mr. Dunn I apologize second chance that's okay Arlington Civics Day Saturday 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. here in Town Hall um, many many different departments including the Board of Selectmen will be here with booths and activities and you can learn more about how your town works I apologize I forgot Motion to adjourn by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Second. Byrne. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All aye. those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you so much.